Okay, um, might as well go ahead and get started. So um, welcome everyone to um, this session of the Marine Seismology Symposium, uh, Harnessing Frontier Technology. Uh, we're very excited to have everyone here um, on behalf of myself, uh, John Orchid and Bob Woodward, who will be um, introducing our speakers and moderating questions. So we'll have a few um, breaks in the agenda as we go. We'll try to stick to time so that we do indeed have those breaks, um, but we encourage everyone to um, engage with your questions while speakers are giving presentations. You can pop those into the chat and we will um, get to those as well as any um, verbal questions that you might have if you wanna raise your hand um, after the presentation and unmute. Um, so at this point, in time, I think I will hand this over to our first section. Um, and I can't remember who was going to introduce, so. <laughs> it's me. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the first speaker uh, today is Itzhak Lohr, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, on the uh, detection capabilities of underwater gas. Itzhak? Sorry, can you see the screen, the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So I'm going to present results from a paper that uh, was just published in uh, JGR on the detection capabilities of underwater dust. And so the study was done here in Gervaso, along with uh, Anthony Sladen, Diane Rive, and Jean Follapueo. Um, and basically, I'm going to present the capabilities of using distributed acoustic sensing on standard telecommunication cables, specifically um, in the Mediterranean, but the same approach can be applied everywhere. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge the DAST team here in Gerozo, quite a bit of uh, staff already. We have three permanent researchers, two postdocs, uh, Martijn van den Ende and myself, and by now four PhD students. Um, I also want to acknowledge the ENSO project, which allowed us access to the infrastructure, to the cables that I'm going to present results from. And the equipment that we use, the dust interrogators, are from the Febus Optics and Aragon Photonics. So since I'm the first one talking about dust today, I'm going to say a little bit about how dust works. So optical fibers, we can think of an optical fiber as this plastic rod. We have a light source that emits a laser beam into one end of the fiber. We can see the beam traversing through the fiber. Most of the light exits on this end of the fiber, but we do see that some of the light is backscattered and exits the fiber on the same end as uh, the light was introduced. So the reason this happens is that when fibers are manufactured, they are simply glass that is being stretched to generate very long, thin fibers. In that process, many anomalies, uh, density anomalies, structure anomalies, many imperfections are created. So when a laser pulse <coughs> goes through the fiber, it interacts with these anomalies. Most of the light is passed through the fiber. Some of the light is backscattered towards the light source. So the way that we utilize this phenomenon to obtain seismic measurements is we um, introduce a seismic interrogator a distributed acoustic sensing interrogator into one end of the fiber. This interrogator sends laser pulses along uh, standard telecommunication fibers, which can be tens of kilometers long. And it also analyzes the light that is backscattered to the interrogator. Now, when an earthquake occurs, when a seismic or acoustic wave field passes through the fiber, it deforms the ground and it deforms the fiber. The fiber stretches and compresses. Now this stretching and compressing of the fiber actually changes the heterogeneities within the fiber. And by analyzing the phase difference between the backscattering pattern at two um, time instances in the same location along the fiber, we can resolve strain or strain rate measurements along the fiber. So this is an example of one cable that we used in this study, deployed offshore Toulon, south of France. The interrogator was placed here in the on-land end of the fiber. This fiber is 45 kilometers long and we were able to obtain measurements every 10 meters. So for these 45 kilometers, we get a seismic trace 
every 10 meters, roughly 4,500 seismograms. And this covers again a vast um, area going from the shoreline to two and a half kilometers beneath the sea level. Uh, so just a few additional words about the differences between DAS and seismometers or OBS. DAS are distributed measurements. We can better resolve the seismic wave field because we measure the ground deformation along tens of kilometers, while seismometers only provide information about the wave field in one position in space. And the measurement type is different. DAS measures strain or strain rate, while seismometers measure velocity or acceleration. Now the conversion between the two is not trivial, um, and I'm going to present uh, one approach of this conversion later in the talk. So why do we want to implement this technology on the seafloor? It's very easy to understand the motivation if we look at this map. So this is the, the current distribution of seismic stations in the Mediterranean region. We see that almost all seismic stations are on land and we have very few stations underwater. But we do know that most of the largest earthquakes on earth and most of tsunami generating earthquakes occur underwater. So we have a very significant observation gap where we don't really have enough instrumentation underwater. So in some places in the world, like Japan, where the seismic risk is very high, they constructed a very expensive ocean bottom um, observatory, many OBSs. Um, but because this is very expensive, it's not a solution that's utilized in many places around the world. Another solution is to use the current infrastructure that's already deployed at the bottom of our oceans. And uh, when I say that, I mean uh, optical fibers that are used commercially for internet for example. So this is a map of the current deployment of optical fibers in the Mediterranean. If we are able to use at least some of these fibers for seismic measurements, it will help us a lot in uh, filling in this vast observational gap. Um, here we have a map of the entire world. You can see that fibers are deployed almost on, on the bottom of all of the world's oceans. So that is a very low cost, high resolution seismic measurement. We already know that we can use it for earthquake monitoring, earthquake and tsunami early warning, imaging of underwater structures. And this is something that I'm currently working on. We can use it to track ships. A paper was just, uh, just accepted by Diane Leve on the topic, study ocean micro um, and maybe observe marine mammals. And this image is just to give you a feeling of how these fibers look like. So the fiber is very thin in the middle, but the cables um, having to withstand very harsh conditions are very thick. This also affects our ability to measure seismic signals. So, previous studies already showed the ability to record seismic signals, and this is a study that came out in Science in 2019. And this cable was buried beneath the sediments for the few, first few kilometers. We see very nice, very clean S wave and P wave arrivals. We have uh, an ability to map fault zones, as we can see here, but this is just a small fraction of cables around the world. Most cables were not intended for seismology, so the coupling between the fiber and the ocean bottom is, uh, is not good at best. This is what we see here. We have one earthquake recorded by this fiber, again, offshore Toulon. We see some sections, for example, here, where we have very high quality seismic records and other sections where we hardly record anything. And this is a main obstacle if you want to use fibers that are already deployed for seismology. Um, when we actually take a look at these fibers with uh, ROVs, we see images like these. We see that the fibers uh, in the vest sections are actually hanging in the middle of the water column, as we see here and here. When they were deployed from the ship, they were just deployed with a certain amount of slack. We're not really sure where they landed and if they actually touch or if they don't touch the sea bottom. So we ask ourselves two questions. The first one is, can we use such cables for seismology? And you can already assume that the answer for the first question is yes. But how are these records compared to standard ocean bottom seismometers and on-land seismometers? And that's a question that I'm going to answer in the remaining part of the talk. So the data that we used from three different cables deployed in the Mediterranean Again, the same cable offshore Toulon and two additional cables offshore Meton in Greece. Three of these cables were used for scientific experiments and we were able to obtain seismic measurements 
uh, for limited times using these cables. So here we have maps of the cable locations, the sensors that we used, the triangles, and the earthquakes that we analyzed. But more importantly, I want you to look at the depth profiles. So we have three different cables, three different lengths. This is the one offshore Toulon from the on land uh, starting point of the fiber. It goes as deep as two and a half kilometers, or, um, with a total length of 45 kilometers. And this specific cable in uh, Greece goes as deep as four kilometers. So again, we only plug in the interrogator on the on land end of the fiber, and we are able to obtain seismic measurements four kilometers beneath, beneath the sea level. And we believe this uh, the ability to obtain these measurements with, uh, with such ease can be a real game changer for marine seismology. So we started out by looking at the noise. And here we have noise PSDs, power spectral densities for the three fibers. Log of frequency is a function of distance along the fiber. You can see that the distances along the fibers are different because the fibers have different lengths. We have a few interesting um, patterns that we see here. First of all, for the Toulon cable, we see secondary macrocytes quite clearly. You can see this pattern here. We see surface gravity waves at about 0.1 Hertz on all three fibers here and here. And we have another interesting pattern specifically for these cables. We have resonance inside the basin. It's kind of hard to see it, but there is slightly higher energy here between one and four Hertz. We were actually able to use the resonance inside the basin that we can see here to resolve the underground structure geological structure of this basin. So that's another another interesting implementation of this technology. Now, now let's see how earthquakes are recorded by um, such fibers. So this is a magnitude 3.7 recorded at 125 kilometers from the interrogator. Here we have distance along the fiber as a function of time. So it's less than 20 seconds of seismic records. We can see a very clear S wave arrival on some sections, it's a bit clearer than others. And we can see that several sections record very high quality continuous seismic signals, and some sections hardly record anything. When we look at the amplitude spectra, we again see the same thing. We also see that some places have uh, specific frequencies that are activated. We see jumps in the frequencies. Again, sections where we don't see any seismic signals. Um, and when we look at the bathymetry, when we compare it to the bathymetry, this is what we can see here. In red, we have the slope along the trajectory of the cable. We see that overall, when we have irregular bathymetry, when the slope changes abruptly, we have low detection capabilities. We can see here that the amplitude spectra is hardly seen. We can hardly see any signal here. And when we look at the time series, also very faint arrivals. We can also see that here their irregular bathymetry. And this section is actually hanging in the middle of the water column. And we, it's kind of hard to see it, but we have zigzag waves going through here. Another interesting thing is the amplification we have here. This is a sedimentary basin where we saw the resonance that we have here. So we see very nice waves that are bouncing off the edges of this basin. And again, very high amplitude strain rate records compared to other sections of the fiber. Now, we want to compare these records to seismometers. First of all, we need to account for the difference in the measurement type. So as I said before, dust measures strain or strain rate, while seismom seismometers measure ground velocity or acceleration. Now, the conversion between the two is typically achieved using the apparent phase velocity. Uh, and this simple equation gives us the transition, the conversion, strain rate equals ground accelerations divided by the apparent phase velocity. Uh, in the same way, strain equals velocity, ground velocity compared with the apparent phase velocity. So in this study, we obtained the apparent phase velocity via FK analysis. Here we have two different earthquakes recorded by the fiber offshore to Toulon, France. Um, the way to look at these images is we have temporal frequency as a function of spatial frequency, and the slopes here correspond to the velocity of the waves. Uh, using these images, we can infer the dispersion curve of these waves. You can see it here. Phase velocity is a function of frequency, very low velocities, around 400 meters per second and less. 
So we can conclude that these are scattered short waves um, that propagate in the interface between the solid earth and the water uh, column. Overall, when we look at this image, we see that uh, significant sections of the fiber are dominated by these short waves. So now we have the apparent velocity and we can go ahead and use this equation to convert acceleration to strain rate or strain rate to acceleration. And we can compare the records of our dust fiber with the adjacent ocean bottom seismometer, you can see here, and we have here additional uh, two on-land seismometers, and the fiber is located here. So on the right, I'm comparing the records uh, 20 kilometers along the fiber, roughly at this location, uh, almost three kilometers beneath sea level. In black, we have the dust amplitude spectra, stacked amplitude spectra, and the different colors, orange, green, and red, are seismometer acceleration spectra converted to strain rate using the apparent phase velocity that we got before. We see a very good fit between dust in black and seismometers in different colors for these two earthquakes. Now, when we look at the different section, you can see here, this is actually inside Metony Basin, inside the, the sedimentary basin that I mentioned before. The image is a bit different. Here we have um, significant side effects. Because we are inside the basin, we have resonance, low frequencies are amplified. Again, in black, we have the dust and in different colors, we have standard seismometers. Low frequencies are amplified and higher frequencies are attenuated. And this is to be expected from sedimentary basin, low velocities, a large amount of scatterers, high frequencies attenuate faster, and because of the resonance, lower frequencies are amplified. Now, what can we say about our ability to detect earthquakes using these cables? So what we show here, our acceleration PSD as a function of frequency. In blue, we have the on-land seismometer. In orange, we have the ocean bottom seismometer. And the way we got these two solid curves for dust is we get the strain rate PSD converted to acceleration PSD using the apparent velocity that we got before, and we can plot it here. Basically, these curves are the detection thresholds. Everything above these lines can be detected. Everything below these lines cannot be detected. Now, the fact that these curves for dust solid curves and for seismometers dotted curves have very similar values tells us that the detection capabilities for dust and seismometers are very, very similar. Now we plot here magnitude one and magnitude two, for example, we can see, uh, and this is at 50 kilometers, we can see that in this case, a magnitude two can be detected while a magnitude one cannot be detected. Now, if we use this approach, we can create such a figure where we plot the signal to noise ratio as a function of magnitude. We see that the signal to noise ratio for dust depends on the apparent phase velocity, because we said that to get these solid curves, we used a specific phase velocity. So the signal to noise ratio highly depends on the phase velocity. When we look at the ocean bottom sensor, this SNR as a function of magnitude does not depend on this velocity. And at a specific velocity here, 570 meters per second, dust and seismometers are equivalent. For slower waves, strain rate amplitudes would be higher and SNR will be higher. For faster waves, the strain rates will be lower and SNR will also be lower. So for example, if we look at an earthquake of magnitude 2.1, it's very reasonable that the direct S waves, which will arrive at a velocity of around three kilometers per second, would hardly be detected, signal to noise ratio of around one. While later arriving phases, surface waves or scattered waves will have higher amplitudes, higher signal to noise ratio, and are uh, better likely to be detected. And another example to better emphasize the importance of the apparent phase velocity on dust measurements. Here we have two different sections for a specific earthquake. One section that hardly records any seismic signals. We do see some faint arrivals here. And another section that records very high amplitude, high quality signals. Now, when we plot the spectra, we can plot the dust spectra in black for the high amplitude section and plot the OBS 
spectra converted to strain rate in orange. Now in this case, the velocity here was very low, the apparent velocity is very low. So we converted the OBS spectrum using a velocity of 240 meters per second. Now when we look at the second section where strain rates are very low, the amplitude spectra is plotted here in blue. And we can use the same OBS spectra, now converted using a different velocity of 1.7 kilometers per second. And again, we get a good fit between converted OBS spectra and in green and dust spectra in blue. So the only reason why we have an order of magnitude difference in strain rate values between these two sections is the value of the apparent phase velocity. So it is a fundamental parameter that controls our ability to record and analyze seismic signals. So to conclude, we saw various noise sources, surface gravity waves, micro seismic resonance inside the shell of sedimentary basin. Uh, overall, the bathymetry dictates measurement quality and our interpretation is that the smoother the bathymetry, uh, smooth bathymetry corresponds to regions where sediments would accumulate and this would result in favorable coupling between the cable and the ocean bottom and also low seismic velocities because uh, unconsolidated sediments will have low velocities. We saw a very good agreement between dust converted signals and seismometer. We do need to account for local uh, amplification and attenuation effects as we saw in the basin. And we can say that the detection capabilities for underwater dust and seismometers are very similar, but we do need to account for the effect of the apparent phase velocity, which will cause better detection for later arriving phases. So this is the reference for the paper that was just uh, accepted. And I just want to show two last slides from something that is already in review in uh, solid earth. Uh, we are working on advancing um, underwater dust towards earthquake only warning. And one of the main challenges is to determine the magnitude and convert strain rate to ground motions for real time. So we have examples here of dust magnitude as a function of seismometer magnitude. And we have a conversion that depends on time between strain rates and ground motion. And you can see that the faster the waves, the, the higher the ground velocity is compared to later arriving phases. And I invite you to read the paper to understand more about it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Itzhak. So we've got time for some questions. Uh, let's see, and I haven't seen any questions pop up in the chat. People can just raise your hand using, um, well, I think you can do that if you use the uh, participant list down at the bottom. I think there's a function for raising your hand or you can just type into the, uh, into the chat. Either way, whether you wanna ask out loud or by message, we've got a few minutes here. It looks like Mark uh, was raising his hand in his video. Oh, so. <laughs> oh okay. I wasn't looking for that. <laughs> he caught me off guard there. Yeah, Mark, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a, uh, a telecommunications cable that's active or if it was put in place for geophysics. Uh, and the other, and the second part, if it is a, a telecommunications cable, there's been some discussions about multiplexing the cable so the by using the appropriate wavelength of the DAS system, you can you can interrogate a telecom cable that's that's uh, transmitting data the normal way, but the, the wavelengths are are different, so it, it doesn't interfere with that. So I'm wondering what what was the case in in this experiment. So here it's a standard telecommunication cable. It wasn't deployed for seismology. In some cases, the cable was active during the time. We just use a different fiber because the, the cables usually have more than one fiber. I'm not familiar with uh, using different wavelengths. Uh, I do know that um, Caltech, the Caltech group just published a paper in science about using uh, active fibers, but looking at the, um, the polarity so that's all I know about the use of uh, active fibers for seismology. I'm not aware of the other application. Okay, thank you. And, and one other, there were there were no repeaters on the on the cable, and this I'm assuming there were no repeaters in the section you interrogated. No, and also 
the cables here are relatively short, so they're up to 45 kilometers. Um, you can see that it's not the standard telecommunication cables that go all the way to another shoreline. They're uh, relatively short, but if there were repeaters, we would be um, limited by them. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Great, and I see a couple of questions have come in via the chat, Itzhak. Uh, one from Joseph Burns. Do uncertainties in cable location affect the estimates of phase velocity for the DAS data? So the phase velocity has nothing to do with the location of the cable. Um, the only thing that does matter is that we have to do the FK transform on a section that's relatively linear. So we don't bias this image. Um, the location of the cable is more, the accuracy in the location of the cable is more important for locating earthquakes. And also if you want to estimate the magnitude, we need to know the um, distance between the measurement point and the source. But for apparent velocity estimation, other than the, other than the FK limitation, um, I mean, that's the only limitation. Thank you. And then let's see, not seeing any other hands up. So we'll go to the next one in the chat. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay, Frederick, do you want to unmute Frederick? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I just had a question about this sort of the type of the interrogator. What do I imagine? Is this a box that you carry around? Is it always there? Is it big? Is it small? Can you give us another one? Yeah, so it's not big. It can go in, in a regular private car along with three other people. Um, because the data is, is so, I mean, you can generate even more than one terabyte per day on these measurements, especially with long fibers and high sampling rates. So it's very hard to keep it in one place because you don't have anything to do with the data. So in our case, we did the limited measurements for up to a few months. Um, but yeah, it can stay in the field and collect data and it's quite small, you only need to put it in the, in the one end of the fiber. It's relatively low maintenance compared to the data that you get. Right, I'll call oh, wait. oh, Casey, you had it, your hand up, yeah. Yeah, um, so this was, yeah, obviously not um, installed um, to measure earthquakes in particular, but if you were to put, like based on the, the noise and the, the signal amplification and that sort of thing that you've investigated here, um, are there um, lessons to be learned for uh, DAS uh, fiber that is installed for seafloor geophysical observations? Um, is it, would you say it's more based on where you put it um, versus actually trying to emplace it um, where you're burying the, those fibers or um, is there sort of a balance between that? I'm sorry, balance between what and what? Uh, sort of like a cost, um, cost versus uh, the signals you're recording. Yes, yeah, so there's the thing, the thing of the apparent velocity or the medium velocity that affects the, the strain rates signals that we record. Um, but if you bury the fiber, you can get, I think it was here, you can get very nice coherent signals along great distances. Um, but it does come at a cost because it costs more to bury these fibers. This fiber is also not meant for seismology, but because of, uh, you know, ships, trawling, fishing, stuff like that, Fibers that are deployed in shallow locations are typically buried. Um, hope, hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Looks like Matt Fouch, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So um, kind of following along the lines of a couple of the other questions, I know you said the cable length is about 40 kilometers. With the IDAS, what is the uh, kind of maximum uh, cable length that you'd be able to interrogate. I know that you'd have a repeater uh, somewhere between maybe 60 and 100 kilometers, uh, but how, how far, what, what's the signal strength and um, uh, kind of the max length of a fiber cable that you could interrogate? Yeah, so, so sorry for the confusion. The IDAS was just because they had a nice picture. <coughs> um, oh, we actually used, a, <laughs> we used the Aragon and Febus. 
So you can see these two cables were uh, used by um, Febus and this one by Aragon. So these are relatively short, up to 25 kilometers, so it's kind of hard to answer the question with this. But you can see with Aragon that from about 35 kilometers along the fiber, the noise increases. The colors are getting uh, brighter. So in this case, I would say that with this specific interrogator, around 40, but that was two years ago, and I'm sure that newer ones on the market, and even this one after being improved, can reach uh, greater distances. Okay, thanks. And you, just to follow up, so you, you, you also are confident in that number because uh, it looks like the bathymetry is fairly flat there, so you're not seeing uh, topographic effects um, complicating the signal. Yes, exactly. Also, this secondary microsystem signal is very, very smooth. Here, the bathymetry is more complicated, so here I'm, I'm certain, yes. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Bruce Townsend. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, I noticed that in the uh, pictures that illustrate the cable uh, suspended in the water column, but looped over a you know, a prominent uh, you know, outcrop of coral or, or rock. When it's when it's passing over uh, that you know, small amount of rock, I mean the coupling between that short amount of fiber and the and the rock must be quite good. Do you get useful information from just that small part that might be even better than when it's just lying on sedimentary uh, seafloor? Yeah, so the thing with that, and I didn't go into the details, is you don't measure the strain at a specific location. You measure it over something that's called the gouge length. So in this case, it was 20 meters. So every measurement along the fiber is actually a measure of the strain induced to the adjacent, you know, 10 meters from each side. So the fact that one point is touching the ground is not really useful because you need at least most of the 20 meter section to be touching the ground. <clears throat> so we, this section is, uh, I mean, if it's only touching in a specific location, it's, it's quite useless. Great, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Probably, I think we've reached the time at which we have to move on to the next speaker. So thank you everyone uh, for the questions and thank you Isak, for the presentation. Very nice. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to John to introduce the next speaker. Yes, the next speaker just spoke, Matt Fausch. Uh, he's going to talk about smart repeaters, I believe. Matt. That's right. Thanks, John. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yes. Great. Excellent. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk today about uh, something that many of you have probably already heard about from uh, uh, certainly a few other talks in these sessions over the last week and a half or so, uh, but also previous talks by one of my co-authors, Bruce Howe, who has been uh, one of the primary champions of smart repeaters uh, for about a decade now. Um, so today, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the uh, design of the smart repeater, talk a little bit about some of the benefits and challenges of the smart repeater concept, and uh, just, just end with uh, some thoughts about kind of the difference between kind of purpose-driven uh, cables uh, versus a smart cable system. Um, so I'd also, besides Bruce, I'd like to acknowledge Steve Lentz from Ocean Specialists Incorporated who's been de deeply involved in, in a lot of the thinking and design of this, uh, along with Bruce, for the last uh, several years. Um, before I do that, I just want to, um, I'm going to cheerlead for just a second and, and talk a little bit about Frontier Technologies. And a lot of this comes from um, the last several years as I've uh, moved away from strictly an academic uh, pursuit into uh, working with the federal government and the private sector, and, and I just want to uh, claim for a moment that these research programs that we think about that enable science and this uh, Marine Seismology Symposium, as we think about harnessing frontier technologies, I think we should demand it of ourselves to think about those that benefit both science and society. Um, the major challenges and the major accomplishments include reducing vulnerability, uh, across the human uh, system, 
we can improve the utility of a lot of the uh, types of technologies that we develop if we are creative about how we might expand those beyond just scientific endeavor. And um, we've already seen this uh, across many of these um, parts of the symposium, but thinking about increasing resiliency. And so this obviously simple Venn diagram is really just to, to lay the claim that uh, all of the research that we have done uh, really can uh, move into other groups, including government agencies and the private sector. There's a lot of challenges that come with that, but I'll, ju I'll just say that um, many of us that have moved on from uh, strictly an academic pursuit, the, the, uh, the wall is not as um, tall to climb as one might think. And there's a lot of opportunities on the other side of that fence um, and interest from many of these other groups. All right, so as we talk about um, smart cables, I just um, want to talk first about the submarine fiber cable uh, network. So this is an example from telegeography. Um, you can download this, it's, uh, you can view this, it's available every day, uh, they have updates. Uh, it's probably the, the best public example of all of the existing fiber cables. And so um, in this map, you can see landing stations or the circles and the colors of the cable distinguish different um, um, uh, past and present cables. So for those of you who don't, um, who aren't thinking about how we are uh, even having this discussion across continents, I just want to remind everybody that about 95% of internet uh, traffic internationally is on, is on these cables. And so this Zoom meeting in particular is enabled by these cables. There's about a million uh, kilometers of total cable length that obviously changes. Um, but overall, that, that's a, a pretty stable number. Uh, it has obviously grown over the last decade or so with um, massive use by um, providers uh, like Facebook and Google and um, streaming services. There uh, are repeaters placed along the cable about every 60 to 100 kilometers. And so in the last talk, you saw a little bit about if we, if you hit one of those repeaters, if you had a long cable length, the, the uh, DAS technology will only make it to the first repeater. Um, but these repeaters uh, end up uh, comprising a large portion of the complication that goes into these deployments. This is an example in the upper right of what one of these repeaters looks like as it's being uh, deployed. Um, so this part of the cable system, I would argue has been virtually untapped and in terms of enabling both science and monitoring capabilities. Um, lately, we've seen great opportunities with DAS. Absolutely, we've also seen state of polarization analyses. Um, uh, William Wilcock had a great summary of that in a previous session. Uh, so I don't wanna go into that in too much detail, but there's a lot of opportunity here. One of the major challenges is that this requires an interfacing with a, uh, a uh, community that we're, uh, is, a, is somewhat challenging to work with. Um, but I think there's some great opportunities and there's a lot of inroads that have been made uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. So I just wanna point out that this is a massive opportunity to build a global, not a regional, a global multi-use, multi-sensor network. And so the vision of smart repeaters has really been, uh, it, it was very nicely summarized in Nature in 2010 by JYU. Uh, the the idea is that you would leverage the commercial cable infrastructure. So along each of these uh, repeaters, and here's an example of these cables it's from a few years ago um, with uh, repeaters about every 75 or 80 kilometers, um, that you would include sensors in those repeaters. Um, start with seismic uh, sensors, pressure, temperature, something simple, something we already kind of know, we've, we've uh, put on the seafloor before we understand kind of how they operate. Um, power and comms would be provided by the cable. And this is a very different kind of power than you might uh, be thinking about if you're thinking about um, uh, Neptune or any of the other cabled observatories. There's a very, uh, a much lower amount of power, um, plenty of communications if you're allowed to tap into it. 
So based on these current and planned cables, there's about 20,000 or so available repeaters across the entire planet. Um, the replenishment lifespan of these uh, cables is around 20 to 25 years. So as these are replenished and new cables are built, for instance, uh, there are efforts perhaps to install cables across uh, the Arctic Ocean. Uh, you have opportunities to include these sensors on the repeaters as the cables are, um, are installed. I just want to note, this is not while they're being uh, repaired. That's, it's uh, not really possible to, to drop in a new repeater, uh, you know, a smart repeater in the middle of that. But just to, re just to uh, kind of repeat, these are multi-scale, multi-use. You can use uh, lots of different sensors, uh, just depends on what you want to interrogate. Um, for about the last 10 years or so, there have been several United Nations agencies and other groups. One of those is a joint task force that's chaired by Bruce Howe that is a, um, comprises three uh, UN agencies. Uh, there's also the UN Decade of the Oceans, which is just starting up. And there are uh, many opportunities and very specific call-outs uh, for uh, a smart repeater kind of technology. So what might this look like? Um, this is a sketch of, of a uh, smart repeater. Um, this, is, uh, this is Steve Lentz's work. You probably, if you've heard about smart repeaters, you've probably seen this. Um, the idea is really just following the basic principles of the US Navy, keep it simple. Um, sometimes they uh, have other words that go on the end of simple, but at the, at the uh, end of the day, you, you must deploy something that uh, is going to be tried and true and works no matter what. So here's an example. This is just a sketch of a, of a repeater pressure housing. Here's some examples of those housings with a person for scale, just to see these are uh, kind of that end to end is about five meters um, in that repeater housing. Uh, the concept would be that you'd put accelerometers or some other, you could also put a intermediate band or broadband seismometer if it's small enough. Um, you could also include pressure and temperature sensors within the repeater housing, or you could build out a sensor pod that is also in line with the cable and is a, um, is a separate device, but along uh, within the cable system. Um, you do have to worry about coupling, you have to worry about penetration um, into the repeater housing. All of those are um, important things that uh, are uh, essential problems to solve. So the idea of keeping it simple, let's use uh, existing technologies. There are already uh, several pressure and temperature sensors out on the market that have been deployed for scientific and other monitoring systems. Um, for, for those uh, sensors, especially seismic, let's use commercial off the shelf. Uh, these do not need to be built for purpose. There are several uh, existing sensors on the market that could uh, form factors could be revised to fit in there. Um, again, as I said, you put the seismic sensor in the pressure housing and then you can put the pressure and temperature um, outside. We think a lot about uh, these three fundamental um, uh, observations, but Obviously, you'd want to build this in, in, a, um, in a modular uh, framework so you could include other sensors um, down the line. Um, just from a, an operational standpoint, we have to start with short haul regional systems first. You got to get your feet wet, so to speak, figure out what's going on, um, what's breaking, what's not. And then you can extend that to uh, longer haul systems like uh, trans transocean systems. Um, there's some basic power challenges to solve here. Um, obviously, you can't impact the uh, repeater and its utility whatsoever, but you uh, do need a little bit of power to power those sensors. Um, but again, it's not a massive, uh, you can't have a massive power draw like you might in a uh, scientific cable. Uh, and then we um, envision just dropping in a gigabit ethernet to start something simple. Obviously, this is a communication system in most cases, we had envisioned that one fiber pair would probably be dedicated to the smart system. Um, uh, obviously, these cables are highly valuable. These uh, cannot have any downtime. Um, the only way that the system will work is if you can ensure that you're not going to have impact the telecom infrastructure.
And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, so some of the societal benefits. I, I, I got on the soapbox for a minute thinking about societal benefits. I just wanna you know, briefly talk about um, the kinds of things that you can do, certainly protecting life and property from tsunami and earthquake early warning, um, mitigating coastal flooding effects. Uh, you can improve societal resilience through understanding the relationship better between sea level and tsunami inundation as you have sea level uh, rise, then obviously your uh, tsunami inundation models have to change um, and we can have better data about that. And also protecting and um, hardening the telecom infrastructure. We frequently think about making observations from a, from a um, environmental monitoring standpoint, but there are great gains to be made uh, in terms of monitoring the cables themselves, understanding where cable problems are or where they're being um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, physically influenced by um, uh, third parties that shouldn't be touching them. There are also national security implications because most of these cables that we're using are also being used by um, federal government agencies to ensure that we can communicate with all of our, uh, all parts of our um, departments of defense, departments of state, et cetera, um, across the world. Um, from a scientific benefit standpoint, when you have pressure and temperature, you can easily start to move into um, important constraints that are far improved on climate change research, including sea level change, ocean heat, circulation, and time space variability, and um, tidal coefficient secular changes. Uh, from a geophysics standpoint, particularly seismology, it's easy to imagine um, vastly improved earthquake detection and characterization as well as improving um, our, how we characterize the fault rupture and, um, and changes in that fault rupture, looking at finite um, fault and also uh, focal mechanism. And then uh, interior earth imaging, here's an example uh, that was published a few years ago, just looking at um, just ray paths when you include uh, a few smart cables. Okay, um, here's a couple of examples just simulating areas when you include smart cables. So this is an example from um, Nishizawa from University of Tokyo doing a, a master's thesis in concert with the um, uh, folks at the NOAA Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. Um, they looked at uh, simulations of earthquake detection times uh, just for the Sunda arc. Uh, they kind of moved into Indonesia a little bit, but really were focused on this area and trying to um, look at changes with and without uh, a few uh, smart systems, which you can see here along the arc. And uh, without going into the details, just in terms of time, um, you can see that the regional detection times improved by about a factor of three in most cases with smart as opposed to without smart. And um, there's similar results in this study uh, when you look at uh, detection of uh, tsunami waves from the pressure sensor. In a separate study, uh, this is from Nathan Becker at PTWC. Um, again, without going into too much detail, just looking at if you added pressure sensors along uh, a few cables, so that, that's these black circles, and you just looked at pressure sensors where you could detect tsunami on three sensors or more, and you only included smart repeaters at every 500 kilometers instead of every you know, 50 or 100, you still get a factor about 25% uh, improvement. Your average warning time drops from about 2.1 hours to 1.6 hours. So there's a few technical challenges um, with, with smart cables. I've, I've, I've hinted at a few of them. First of all is the dependability. That is absolutely essential uh, for commercial cable um, vendors and people, and it's the primary challenge as we move forward in uh, continued conversations with how these might be adopted. Um, related to that is minimal or zero impact on telecom functions. These cables are being put in the water to make money. They're transmitting data that's critical to uh, everything from banking to making sure that you this Zoom video works to um, that your Netflix or Hulu stream is working and any downtime equates directly to dollars. So you can't uh, have any sort of impact on that telecom. From a sensor standpoint, some of these sensors 
are uh, not really built to be um, uh, to operate for decades without calibration. And so there's still a challenge in, in making sure that you're utilizing commercial off the shelf sensors that don't need to be calibrated or you're creatively creating opportunities for calibration. And the final thing is that uh, depending on the, the company, sometimes the way things are deployed is um, somewhat different. So you have to be able to accommodate that. Obviously you're not going to solve all these at once. So you have to start somewhere. Um, so who's the customer and user base? Um, you know, we're, we think a lot about, and I, I haven't even included NSF on here, um, actually intentionally, because we, we can easily imagine if there were sensors on the ocean floor, uh, there would be plenty of opportunities uh, to find research funding from NSF. You can easily imagine other agencies like NOAA, US Geological Survey, and NASA being interested. Uh, NASA cares a lot about disasters, for instance, and they have lots of partnerships with other groups focused on natural disasters. Um, our discussions with folks in Department of Defense and Department of State, there's, there's certainly a lot of interest. Um, they don't buy cables, they just buy cable time. Um, but, but these are certainly things of interest um, uh, that uh, if these were more widely available, there could be opportunities. Uh, the research community, which I'm speaking to you now, obviously would be, I, I think, very interested and uh, certainly international agencies and governments. I think one of the things that the um, Joint Task Force on Smart Cables has done an excellent job of is promoting uh, the notion of smart cables uh, internationally. It's actually international partners that are really jumping up uh, and trying to adopt this uh, sooner than domestically. Of course, uh, it's essential that we get the cable suppliers to be interested at some point. That is a primary challenge. And some of the primary internet content providers like Google and Facebook, um, they're involved in some of those conversations with the joint task force. Um, there's certainly some interest, but there's, a, there's definitely a chicken and egg conversation. Uh, if, if, the, if there is a uh, stable repeater that's available, they might be interested, but unless there's a business case by one of these, uh, by some of the big uh, customers, it's difficult to develop that. And uh, we're very interested and focused on trying to bridge that gap. Just uh, show you one example here. Um, uh, this is uh, my second to last slide. Uh, just talking about CAM2. So the original CAM ring, this is the uh, continental, um, continental Europe or Portugal to the Azores to Madeira. The original ring is um, still in place. Uh, it is being is going to be rebuilt here in the next few years. This is a domestic system. It has international connections, but from a permitting standpoint, it's only Portugal. So it's actually an excellent opportunity for smart cables to be installed uh, because you don't have to go through the same uh, per permitting process with multiple governments. In the CAM2 ring, there's an explicit requirement for various kinds of monitoring, including tsunami ocean, environmental, and seismic monitoring. And one of the reasons for that is that um, it, even though uh, the entire economy of Portugal changed in, after the Lisbon earthquake and tsunami, there's somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 deaths. And the level of destruction fundamentally altered the economic landscape of the entire country. Um, the total length of this is about 3,700 kilometers. It will, be re will have repeaters, you can see um, those notional repeaters in these red circles. Um, if you're not uh, colorblind like me, which uh, makes it a little bit difficult, but uh, hopefully you can see those on your screen. It's about 120 million euro to start. The RFP starts this year and, um, and uh, the RFS or ready for service is in three years. So there's still an opportunity here. There's certainly a lot of effort going into trying to figure out how to um, instrument the CAM2 ring with SMART. Um, there's also roughly 10 other systems. I won't go through the laundry list, but there's either uh, a requirement or an option to have uh, a SMART system uh, on those cables. Um, let's see. So then I just want to uh, finish up here with uh, talking about the difference between a sensor-enabled cable and a SMART cable. So a sensor-enabled ca cable is obviously important. These are purpose-driven. Uh, these are usually for monitoring. 
sometimes for science, they are, they are sensor first. They're built off of a sensor. They're engineered for the sensors to function. They're usually re regional scale deployments um, and they don't require commercial grade reliability. Obviously you don't want downtime, but at the same time, your primary goal is to record data from the sensors on that cable. That is, and so the cable needs to work, but the sensors uh, need to work. Uh, so, so it's a sensor centric model. Within smart cables, you obviously have the sensor monitoring. We think about, as I've said, pressure, temperature, and seismic. Um, we very much will have a modular design so we can incorporate other sensors in the future. Um, but we're focused on using the telecommunications technology. So you start from that repeater framework and then you integrate the sensors. And so this, the, the ART in SMART is the critical design element. It's by far the largest engineering challenge. And you, in our model of how this would work, you obviously want to be able to utilize it on any commercial cable system, but you would have to start somewhere. Um, but the design is driven by reliability, how you can scale it and how you can price it so that um, your customers will still buy it. And that's a very different model than coming in from a sort of research or monitoring framework. So I'll, I'll just leave you with the thought that you can't have a smart cable without the art. And I'll uh, stop there. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for an excellent talk. So we've got time for some questions. Uh, again, either uh, raise your hand over in the participant uh, using the participant list or enter your questions in the chat. I might jump in with a question right up front. Um, Matt, you alluded several times to the to, to managing our expectations on the power budget that might be possible. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Can you quantify what might be possible? And then a second part to that question is, are there any state of health sensors on these repeaters today that provide a model or a proxy for what we'd want to do? Yeah, so typically the power budget that we're trying to work with is about one watt. So that's roughly in line, um, somewhere in the half watt to watt um, uh, would, would be ideal. In an early system, you can imagine that uh, just from a, say a prototype standpoint, you're not going to hit that power threshold, especially if you just want to deal with the communications element, uh, you kind of leave that alone and, and deal with that at the end. Um, but that would be, especially for these long haul cables, you can't, you can't expect to get a lot out of the, out of the sensor or out of the repeater. Um, so current, um, current monitoring systems, there is some state of health on some uh, cables. There are some vendors who tend to be more uh, the push into the R&D side that have included some of these sensors on a few test cables. Um, I'm not able to talk about um, who they are exactly, what the sensors are um, due to NDAs, but I can tell you that they're, um, they're interesting results, um, but the sensors that have been used so far on these commercial cables are um, very low quality. So you imagine like a, a very low end uh, accelerometer, for instance. Um, so while you get some information about what happens to the cable, say, as it's descending to the ocean floor and, and things about you know, what's the impact uh, as the uh, repeater lands, um, there's less uh, kind of utility in the data beyond that. Um, and they're not necessarily currently configured to continue, uh, record continuously or transmit continuously. Hmm. On the other hand, um, people are definitely thinking about it. Um, and so, you know, just that proof of concept, I think is, is very interesting, but to go from something that, um, the way I've been thinking about it is, you know, the early Mars landers really had, they had accelerometers all over the place, but that was just to make sure that uh, they understood kind of what was happening to the landing system uh, as it was uh, impacting and making its way. So it was uh, much more um, about the flight than what happened uh, during arrival. But you can imagine that there are many more sensors on present day Mars rovers, including Perseverance, that start to give you that opportunity to maybe uh, record a little bit of in situ information. Um, so I think there's a lot of analogies uh, there, but uh, there's nothing kind of commercially available and there's nothing that's publicly available at this point. 
Okay, interesting. Thank you. Other questions for Matt? I see one from Tim Parker oh, yeah, on there's the one chat. From Tim. Uh, so what is the impact when a cable lands? Follow up to what you were just talking about. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's not horrible. Um, I, without kind of going into too much detail, I, these are definitely engineered to have a fairly um, uh, significant impact, sort of on the G to two G range. Um, any system that you have, you know, it, that's deployed in there, you'd be able to. You need to be able to manage that. But you can easily envision a range of seismometers and um, high-end accelerometers that are already on the market that would have no problem with that. It'd actually give you more data to understand about that um, deployment. The other thing that I should mention, and I think the last speaker gave a great example um, up front, you know, a lot of these cables are not necessarily um, designed to be coupled, right, with the ocean floor. So in some areas they trench and they'll deploy the cable, uh, at least in the ocean sediments uh, below surface. Um, that would, ideally be a requirement for future cables, but it can't be for, for all. And so you do have to think about relative coupling. Um, my standpoint on this, it, it's no different than throwing a, um, any seismometer on the moon or Mars. Any data is better than no data to get started as long as you're not impacting the mission. So I think you learn from that, uh, those early deployments and you improve as you go. We have time for maybe one. Oh, I see uh, Will Wilcock. Yeah, I, I had a question about whether you need a dedicated fiber pair for smart cables, because that would take about 10% of the capacity away from a transoceanic cable. So that would cost quite a lot of money. Uh, it's not absolutely essential. Uh, I think that our thinking is, and from talking to um, some of the vendors, um, having a dedicated pair, uh, fiber pair, makes it a little bit, um, uh, there's less concern that you might be impacting the functions, the telecommunication functions of the cable. Um, I think there are, uh, I, I know that there's been a lot of effort uh, in recent years to fill that uh, repeater housing with more fiber pairs. So you might have um, less impact in terms of the total bandwidth. Uh, from some of the newer systems, but then you also have the trade that you may not have as much space in the uh, pressure housing to incorporate your sensors. But it's an important it's a uh, it's an important uh, issue to solve. I don't think uh, I, I think we could go either direction on that. Um, but uh, our current thinking is to try and have a dedicated pair. Okay, I think we have time for one last quick question before the break, if there's a short question. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, then maybe uh, thank you, Matt, for an excellent talk. Appreciate it. Thank you all for the questions. And I think I'll turn it back over to Casey. I think we're scheduled for a break now, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think we're actually keeping to time, which is great, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone. Actual applause, too. Um, and yeah, because this is such a long session, I know we've got people coming in from all over. Um, Itzhak is, is over in Europe, and so it's super late. We've got one speaker who hasn't shown up yet, but I forgot that it's going to be morning <laughs> when they show up. So um, we're really branching the globe here, just like those fiber optic cables. So yes, um, at this point in time, we'll take a break. Uh, get up, go get some water, or some dinner, breakfast, lunch, whatever, um, snacks. Sorry, we can't distribute snacks to everybody. <laughs> um, but yes, please go use your break. And Casey, the, it resumes at 25 minutes after the hour. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, and as soon as I can find my slides, I will share that slide. Unless, um, Monica, did you want to test? Um, yeah, okay, you can go ahead first and then we'll put this break slide up. Bob and Casey, I assume you can still hear me, right? Yep. Yes. Good. 
Okay, well, it's 25 minutes after the hour, according to my clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so this is the uh, second, I guess, sub-session of the uh, Harnessing Technologies session. Uh, so let's, I will go ahead and start by introducing the next speaker. So the next speaker is uh, Monica Kohler on the research faculty at Caltech. And she's gonna be talking about engineering challenges and opportunities for a long-term autonomous broadband seafloor seismographic network. She's got her first slide up. So Monica, please. Thanks, thanks very much, Bob. I wanna start off by saying that um, in my presentation, this is gonna be very much kind of a big picture vision for where I and a, a group of us working on this uh, think we could be in the next 10, maybe 20 years. Uh, and so it's, uh, I wanna present kind of a vision, an engineering vision for where um, and what a, glo a global seismic network could look like. Uh, and, the, and the ideas and the contributions that uh, I'll be showing in this presentation come from a number of different people, um, many of whom served on a working group on long-term seafloor seismographs, whose name you see here um, on the left-hand side of this slide. Uh, and in addition, I had um, quite, a quite a lot of uh, very good uh, contributions from additional people whose names you'll see on the slides that, uh, that I'll show. So let me put this in a big picture context. Um, just make sure I can forward my slide. Just waiting for my second slide to come up here. You might have to click on the window that it's in. I'm not sure if something went astray when we were on the break. Maybe a forward arrow. Hmm. Of course, we tried everything except that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I see a delay in forwarding. Uh, here we go. All right. So, um, yeah, let's, if, if I have delays in the, in the in future slides, we'll, we'll know what's going on. All right. So uh, let me put this idea into um, a, a different kind of relatively new context. And that is the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, or Ocean Decade. On uh, February 3rd uh, of this year, the US National Academies kicked off the launch meeting for Ocean Decade. Uh, and this is a global framework to ensure that ocean science and ocean science research helps government uh, and societies achieve major goals of this generation. Um, 10 challenges were identified during this kickoff meeting, uh, and many are closely related to the global seismic network needs that I'm gonna describe here. Moving into the 21st century, the ocean decade, uh, US and international communities are going to invest in key engineering areas and, and enabling technologies uh, that will um, uh, benefit uh, the sciences and the blue economy, which is defined as the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, while preserving the health of ocean ecosystems, or more generally, um, economic activities that are related to oceans, seas, and coasts. And specifically, uh, four uh, technology areas that you see on the lower left-hand side of this slide uh, that were discussed include uh, uh, engineering developments in sensors, electronics, optoelectronics, mechanical design, and chemical processes, which for us would include things like corrosion, uh, materials, energy harvesting, communications network and signal processing, as well as autonomy, machine learning, uh, and artificial intelligence, and robotics. The experimental and computational activities that can be built on top of these new engineering technologies include things like mapping, imaging and sensing, positioning, the development of underwater Internet of Things and autonomous and remotely operated vehicles. Uh, and these technologies are the enablers for new research and development in ocean sciences uh, that will help achieve the goals of the of the blue economy uh, within the ocean decade uh, reference. So honing in on our global seismic network application, uh, which fits in very well with one of the applications for Ocean Decade, um, there's been long a recognition uh, that, uh, at least among our community, that long-term seafloor seismic stations are essential uh, and necessary for filling large geographic gaps in coverage of seismic data. Uh, that are necessary for uh, carrying out activities, for example, inferring mantle and core structure and dynamics, 
rheology, temperature and compositional variations. And all of these lead to uh, understanding of Earth's structure and earthquake faulting. Filling the gaps will reveal not just new small scale structures uh, associated with every time of a type of tectonic setting and ocean continent transition zones, but also small scale processes that are going on with the earthquake rupture process. And even today, most of these suffer from uh, bias with the use of land only stations. Moreover, the ability to estimate earthquake size and faulting characteristics uh, are still constrained by uh, land, uh, primarily land only data or island only data. Uh, particularly when we think about the constraints that, uh, uh, that data are providing uh, for the mechanics of tsunami generation and submarine landslides. So these, uh, the, the ongoing data needs um, motivated the working group for long-term seafloor seismographs um, to uh, come up with a global survey, a, a survey that was sent out the, to the global seismology community to identify the highest priority needs, scientific needs and data needs, as well as motivations for where new stations could be placed on the seafloor uh, to fill those data gaps. And uh, this uh, kind of table or bulleted list that you see in the middle of the slide is a summary of the outcome of that survey that was answered by um, uh, members of the global seismology community uh, worldwide. And I'm not gonna go into all of the details that uh, came out of this survey results, but here you can see it really spans a large number, really spans all regions of, of the globe uh, from inner core out to the lithosphere. It spans both earthquake sources and non-earthquake sources. Uh, and spans a wide variety of data types from short period teleseismic body waves to low frequency acoustic and low frequency surface, uh, surface and normal modes. Uh, and as well, the survey um, revealed the desire for real time or at least near real time applications uh, for things like tsunami, um, tsunami monitoring. One of the sets of activities that this uh, working group carried out um, was to produce uh, produce maps of locations on the sea floor where new stations on the sea floor could provide new data sets. And one of those maps is, is shown here on the right hand side of the slide. These maps were uh, produced by Jessica Irving. Um, and here too, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what these maps, each of these maps provided, but we, we uh, generated about 15 maps for 15 different seismic uh, phases uh, in which we identified locations on the sea floor where if we had a seismic station placed in those locations, it would best record a particular type of seismic phase. So this map on the right shows locations on the seafloor that would best uh, provide the largest number of, for example, SS phase observations uh, in three different um, time spans from one and a half years to five years to 10 years. And although I won't uh, show other maps uh, for, different, for, for all the various different phases that we looked at, one of the takeaways that we got from looking at these maps after cross-referencing them with studies that had been carried out, looking at, for example, tomographic images of interior Earth structure that identified where that structure was still fuzzy and low resolution. One of the takeaways that we got from this cross-referencing was that there are key locations on the seafloor uh, that are really can be optimized or can be optimal locations for uh, observing quite a large number of different seismic phases in much greater number than what is done today. And those like locations are particularly in the southern uh, hemispheric regions of, of, the, of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, as well as in the Southern Ocean. So, the, uh, there's a very close, uh, there are very close ties with the current global seismographic network. Uh, and in the upper left hand side of this slide, you see a current, uh, a map of the current configuration of the global um, seismographic network stations um, mapped in terms of uh, station coverage or number of stations within 10 degrees of each station location. The vision behind a globally spanning seismic network really fits in very well with GSN. And by the way, GSN is operated by uh, IRIS, the US Geological Survey, as well as international partners. Uh, and the requirements behind the GSN stations are first that there is a global distribution of uh, approximately uniformly spaced stations at 2000 kilometers. Obviously we don't have that yet, 
uh, and locations in the oceans in the uppermost left map here on this slide are locations where there are island um, stations that are contributing to the GSM data. But if we think about uh, filling the ocean basins where there is still no station coverage and no data coverage, no data recording, we could think about this in terms of a notional distribution of additional stations in those basins, uh, and particularly, uh, or more specifically, 34 additional stations in basins that would help meet the goals for global coverage similar to the coverage that we see on land for GSN stations, if we consider a 20 degree separation between stations. And so in this lower left map, in the white circles, these are um, potential locations for those 34 additional stations that could help complete out uh, the entire globe surface of station coverage that meets um, GSN uh, seismic network requirements. If we compare this, for example, to a map where there are uh, currently uh, seafloor cables that are of potential use for seismic sensing, um, some interesting features stand out and really kind of motivate the thinking that uh, autonomous seafloor stations could be complementary to using seafloor cables for seismic monitoring. In this map on the right, um, you see in green the curves where uh, submarine cables currently exist with the potential of being used for seismic sensing. In uh, orange and red, you see the location of earthquakes that have occurred over the last 40 or 50 years with magnitudes greater than six. And in addition on this map, you see in sort of light transparent blue color, for example, this one here, uh, locations where there was there is coverage that is provided by an existing GSN station. But what this map also shows is the very many large areas, for example, here in the Eastern Pacific, uh, in the Southern Pacific and Southern Oceans, uh, in part of the Atlantic uh, and Indian Oceans, and again, the Southern Oceans uh, on, the, on the Atlantic side, locations where there isn't any submarine cable coverage. And so again, this uh, autonomous seafloor station idea could be considered complementary to where there is coverage um, provided by the submarine cables. So there are big holes in part of the ocean basins, uh, and these are regions where there is not likely to be cables, at least not for a very long time, uh, where the global network of autonomous stations could complement these, these uh, other covered areas. So, if we think about using uh, or installing autonomous stations to complete out global coverage of a seismic network, what, what are the requirements? First of all, I'll state that, that you know, kind of the overall vision is that uh, new developments and in instrumentation uh, should, be, um, should be developed uh, so that the instrumentation can enable multi-year, so at least four years uh, and, and uh, potentially more, deployments of autonomous broadband seismometers on the seafloor in a way that they can remotely transmit continuous waveform data for global earthquake monitoring systems in near real time. So what I wanna do is I wanna focus on various, um, the various engineering components of uh, our vision for what these autonomous stations could look like. The sensors uh, based on the global seismic data needs uh, are ideally broadband um, seismometers together with a co-located pressure sensor. Uh, where these seismometers have a sensitivity to a broad range of seismic wave frequencies, anywhere from thousands of seconds to uh, ideally 25 hertz. They should be triaxial in order to be able to record the kind of phases that uh, we need on both vertical and horizontal components. And seismometer burial technology really does need to be developed so that we can reduce the noise on the horizontal components due to seafloor currents. And, and together with this material and packaging that goes with long-term of semi-permanent stations. We could also use new developments in robotics and telemetry. That is the use of wave gliders or autonomous underwater vehicles or even autonomous ships for deployment, servicing and near real-time telemetry, uh, at least of continuous low rate, low sample rate seismic data from the seafloor to the shore. On the seafloor stations, uh, developments in smart algorithms running on the seafloor stations could flag events of interest in order to optimize the telemetry load. That is to enable the two-way communications uh, in a robotic um, sense between shore and seafloor stations uh, with segments of high sample rate data that are associated with significant events. We 
could also use new developments in energy and, uh, and energy uh, power harvesting. That is the development of, of power management systems that are capable of delivering multiple watts to a single site for at least four years. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about one possible energy harvesting uh, procedure that uh, could be um, taken advantage of for uh, new sources of energy. And then timing, uh, uh, a need for higher accuracy timing that can be sustained over many years. So I want to first focus on the sensor needs, uh, because I think sometimes this gets a little bit lost in our um, discussions on what uh, new seafloor stations uh, should look like and what sort of hardware they should contain. Uh, and certainly for global seismology needs, uh, there's a wide range of types of seismic data. And these two figures here from two different papers just sort of represent two not necessarily end members, but two types of data uh, that provide good uh, kind of focal points for the kind of data that uh, a sensor, uh, the, the sensor that we need for this type of seismic network should, should be able to record. So on the left, you'll see a figure from a paper published by Thomas and Lasky in, in GJI in 2015, showing body wave phases that were identified on broadband OBSs. These, uh, uh, in particular, this was um, the PDP body wave, um, which uh, you can see from uh, the schematic, also from their paper uh, shown here, is a P wave that has one bounce off the top side of a thin layer in the lowermost mantle, just above the core mantle boundary before returning to the surface. And in, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in about 30 Hawaiian plume broadband OBSs that were deployed over two one-year phases, about seven events showed identifiable PDP signals um, that, were, that had periods between three and seven seconds, where three seconds is really starting to push in a favorable way, kind of the, the short period end of the kind of body waves that uh, could be recorded on broadband OBSs. Over this two year period, seven events showed these identifiable PDP signals. And that's partially because there's a limited number of events that can uh, within a limited range and uh, uh, distance range and depth range for a large enough magnitudes that can produce um, relatively short period body waves like these um, uh, with good enough signal to noise. The authors also concluded that SDS and SKS, SKSA uh, phases should also be observable in these types of data sets with the appropriate um, horizontal component orientation. And on the other kind of spectrum um, end, end, um, end member, um, the figure on the right kind of shows uh, what, what those type of data could look like or, or, or do look like in OBSs uh, deployed at the right, um, uh, deployed in the right locations and uh, picking up very large events of interest. This is a figure from a paper per, um, uh, published in GRL in 2011 by Passell et al. And this, these curves, the top three curves that I've outlined here with this red box, uh, show uh, normal modes, Earth-free oscillations. In this data set, in these three OBSs, which were deployed um, at the Lesser Antilles subduction zone in the Western Atlantic, uh, PSDs were uh, calculated from the vertical components and the spectral peaks in these PSDs show Earth's spheroidal normal modes at frequencies between 0.2 and 5 millihertz, so at periods between 5,000 and 200 seconds. So I just uh, you know, want to kind of use these two different publications and these, these uh, figures showing these data sets to emphasize that there, are very, there can be very stringent data, uh, sensor needs for uh, the kinds of seismometers that we want to deploy for global um, Earth studies. So let's think about then what a sensor burial system might look like. Um, these images are from a group at Scripps um, who has uh, uh, developed this idea for the way uh, the sensor might be um, buried in order to reduce those seafloor current noise um, levels. This is just one example um, of how a seismometer burial device might be deployed via a ship's wire with telemetry. And I won't go into a whole lot of detail about um, the engineering, but just want to point out that in this burial device, um, uh, which consists of uh, the hardware associated with the seismometer as well as a pumping system, that uh, the burial system would initially land on the seafloor and that 
pump, uh, pump system would then bury the seismometer below, be, below the seafloor uh, with the rest of the hardware package left on the seafloor. And then this burial tool could then get extracted by reverse um, pumping and recovering via a ship wire or an ROV. And similarly, this same sort of, of pump system idea for sensor burial uh, could be deployed via free fall and installed with an ROV. It almost goes without saying that uh, the earth, there are earthquake uh, source applications um, which also require uh, globally, dis globally distributed um, data sources. And um, so, of course, the recording and distributing near real-time data from stations in the deep ocean, ocean open oceans uh, will increase the accuracy of publicly disseminated and globally occurring earthquake parameters, such as location, rupture, kinematics, and magnitude. Um, but in addition to that, uh, data flowing from seafloor stations are critical for agencies monitoring the evolving tsunamis in warning systems. And for example, here uh, is um, uh, on the right hand side of this slide is an image showing the deep ocean tsunami amplitude forecast that was made a couple of weeks ago for that uh, magnitude 8.1 Kermadec Islands uh, earthquake that, it, that had occurred just north of New Zealand. And what you see from this image is that uh, the forecast of the tsunami amplitudes in the open ocean stays almost, uh, at least the forecast of the large amplitudes, stay almost entirely in the, in the southern hemisphere, um, where um, uh, station coverage on the seafloor is uh, nearly zero. Uh, and in fact, for this earthquake, there were, no for there were no updates to the forecast for many, many hours, simply because there was no input from data from the seafloor in the direction of the tsunami propagation. Um, uh, primarily to the east of, of the earthquake source. And of course, this is of, of uh, concern um, for tsunami propagation paths, uh, which stay within regions that are not well instrumented, at least at the moment. Uh, for example, here again with this Kermadec Islands uh, earthquake, where the tsunami forecasts here now for the coastal amplitude forecast was quite large at very distant regions uh, along uh, Central and South America, again, in a region where there isn't currently um, coverage uh, from seismic stations or um, uh, pressure gauge data. So moving on to what the data offload technology could look like, um, I'm showing here some various um, ideas or concepts for a variety of platforms for data offload that have been developed um, by Woods Hole um, and, and, and Scripps and, and tested kind of on a one-off basis. And so here, uh, what these platforms describe are ways to offload data from the digitizer using either acoustic modems or optical modems uh, where the acoustic modem is um, uh, a little bit slower uh, than optical, however, re doesn't require very close distances between the offload platform uh, and the digitizer, uh, where optical is faster but requires smaller distances. Uh, and these various platforms include, for example, uh, offload and transfer of the data using a glider uh, or using autonomous underwater vehicle devices. Um, or possibly using ships of opportunity. And uh, so these have, these have been tested, but require integration into a larger package in order to show that they could work on a long-term basis from, from uh, seafloor locations in the deep open ocean. Finally, I want to um, talk a little bit um, now about a possible energy harvesting idea that has been developed uh, by a company called SeaTrek um, and that is uh, currently uh, in collaboration with um, uh, marine seismologists at, um, at Scripps, um, where energy harvesting is um, taking advantage of a thermocline powered flat platform. And um, so in this uh, energy harvesting um, uh, potential setup, a device uh, that uh, a device uh, that has a solid to liquid phase change ability, shown here by this uh, green triangle, or rather green rectangle, oscillates between water depths around the thermocline, uh, which occurs between about 200 and, and 1,000 meters depth. And the behavior of, the, of this device or this platform relies on the changes in temperature in these thermocline layers, where warmer temperatures uh, near the surface, up to about uh, plus five degrees C relative to the average, turns the solid into a liquid, 
uh, which is where the energy is, is generated. Uh, and then the device uh, sinks down to lower temperature uh, regions where the cooler temperatures then freeze the liquid. And it's during this expansion phase that this device would directly send power to the OBS uh, located below it, uh, where there's a tethered link between the, uh, the energy harvesting device and the OBS. And initial tests uh, in collaboration between CTREC and, and uh, Scripps have shown that uh, reliably one watt of power could be stored uh, uh, or rather could be generated and stored in, on -site, uh, in an on-site battery. And in fact, uh, the, the Scripps folks have just, men have just mentioned that actually up to seven watts uh, could possibly be generated and stored in on-site batteries. And in fact, in this platform setup, there is even the possibility that in the opposite direction, data could be transferred uh, to the device via a hardwired uh, connection uh, to then transfer data via um, satellite, iridium satellite connection to land stations or land sites. So I'm just gonna conclude by saying that uh, with all of these different uh, engineering components that I've mentioned, they've actually all been developed as um, kind of small scale one-off or standalone um, uh, components. Uh, and uh, they're currently, many of them are still in the process of being tested uh, and have shown success in terms of, um, in terms of their um, uh, capability, but they do need to be integrated, all of them into a, uh, into a long-term a single autonomous OBS station. Uh, and if we think about covering the sea floor with as many as 34 stations, for example, to complete out the coverage, this idea of the integrated components really needs to be reclable. Uh, 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 that is that multiple stations um, do need to be, uh, we have to have the ability to, to deploy multiple stations with multiple sensors at each station uh, in order to build in redundancy into the network. So, we, we uh, do need to focus on not just the platform for the telemetry, but on the sensor needs, on the power needs and flexibility and location needs for the new stations. Um, but I think that advancements in the individual components are making this direction viable. Um, as far as future goes, I would encourage the community to continue to think about large scale non-siloed thinking and investment and, and how this could be um, supported uh, because it, because the locations of many of these sensors don't necessarily correspond to a highest priority seafloor stations in terms of uh, tectonic setting uh, or seismicity. Uh, but some of those stations, many of those stations do then, could then produce uh, data that go towards the higher priority needs in terms of providing coverage for interior earth uh, ray paths uh, and surface wave paths. So um, I just wanna uh, end the talk by showing um, the citation, which is a, a kind of a report or a plan that uh, uh, we wrote, we the working group members of uh, long-term seafloor seismograph working group wrote. Uh, and if you wanna uh, obtain more details on some of the uh, details in this presentation, you can find them in this report, um, in this paper published in um, SRL last year. All right, thanks, I'll wrap that up then. Uh, good. Uh, are there any questions uh, for the speaker at this point? I could uh, ask a question. That, that, uh, one of the th uh, things that I think was not included in the study by the uh, that you did with the uh, the committee was the any thoughts about the Arctic in particular? Um, by committee, do you mean the working group? Yes. Yeah, we, we didn't think, um, we, no, we didn't consider the Arctic um, or frankly near, you know, Antarctica either. And um, part of that I think was that uh, at the time when we began our activities, we were, um, you know, we, did, we wanted to make sure that we were focusing on areas that have open ocean year round. Um, but um, certainly, uh, I, think, I, I think that there are also new developments that would now enable the placement of a long-term seafloor seismograph, you know, in regions where we're near the Arctic or Antarctica. And um, furthermore, we wouldn't have to be 
I, I think there are new developments that would allow us to be able to uh, uh, deploy stations under, you know, sea ice that covers some of those lo locations part of the year. Uh, there is a question from Matt uh, about the uh, costs. Uh, Matt, are you online? Yeah, I think that one's from Will Wilcock. Um, if you want to oh, okay. first. Yeah. Right. So I, I think that, you know, cost is, um, it's an interesting question because, so, you know, what is meant by cost? Um, if we were to think about um, the kind of the developments that are needed to integrate all of these components into a single package, uh, and then um, maybe deploy something like one station with five sensors or, you know, five stations with, with one sensor each, for example, and then test that for um, a long enough period of time, um, th that cost is probably around $10 million. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of distributed across the board from uh, purchasing the hardware that's necessary, integrating and testing the hardware, and then doing the actual in-placement, you know, deep ocean testing. Uh, are there other questions? Yeah, John, I, this is Matt Fouch. Um, my question is uh, uh, related to kind of the, not necessarily the cost, but where the investment comes from. So I understand you're thinking about kind of cross programs within NSF. It strikes me that there's some important opportunities with other agencies, um, perhaps NOAA, um, Navy, and uh, the private sector. Is, is this really kind of an NSF focus or are there discussions with um, scientists funded by some of those other groups or um, the agencies themselves that fund the, the science and the monitoring? I think it's both actually. Um, I do think that there is um, a place uh, where this is, this is you know, possibly an, an NSF type of um, investment that could be made. Um, but I also think that there is there are a lot of opportunities for partnerships with other organizations. And the Navy is one really obvious example. Um, the Navy has a lot of um, uh, interest in seafloor deployments that you know overlap with the, with the, you know the ideas that we have for global seismic network. And furthermore, the Navy has developed um, hardware and deployment, particularly hard, uh, deployment hardware that could be of use in this. So I, I think that the Navy is one, a uh, very likely partner uh, in addition to NSF. Uh, certainly private partnerships um, makes sense too, although we have not um, you know, ex explored that yet. One other group that would be interested, I think is probably the test ban treaty <coughs> group in, uh, in Vienna and elsewhere um, would have interest in uh, the distribution. Any other questions? All right. I see that well, thank you. has a question, John. Go. Go ahead. Spar? Let's see. He's, I don't know, maybe if he doesn't have a microphone, I can, it's typed into the chat so I could read that or John, you may want to read it. If you've got the chat window open. And Monica. Oh, yeah, let me uh, take a look. Okay. Ah. Spar, how do you convince reviewers to spend a few million dollars on a single site versus deploying a series of two-year deployments of arrays of standard OBSs, such as what's being done now? That's that's actually a really good question. And you know, I kind of alluded to that, although I didn't say it explicitly. Um, and I think that, so one of the things that we have to bear in mind, this was sort of part of my, um, when I showed the two figures from the papers to show the kind of data that, that um, you know, we need to consider that, that sensors can, can record. The kind of data that are needed for, um, uh, you know, improving coverage of body wave phases and, and, and so forth um, require, uh, you know, as we all know, very high signal to noise, which means that we need to wait for the very large earthquakes to produce enough data that we can analyze in these sorts of, you know, seismic tomographic type of, of studies. And so these, these require waiting in a single site for long times uh, in order to record enough earthquakes with large enough magnitude and large enough signal to noise that we have enough data to analyze. Very often in our short deployments, which are still only at around, you know, one and a half years max, 
um, you know, unless we're really lucky with the type of seismicity that occurred during that deployment, we generally don't have enough events um, to record enough, you know, enough of the same kind of data to beat down the noise. So it's really an, a signal to noise argument, um, um, as well as a, we need to wait for those large events that actually produce the phases of interest type of argument. Uh, Matt has a question again, I believe. Uh, I was just resp responding to Spar, just saying that you'd also want to make the case that monitoring would have to be a primary focus. If you're just doing temporary deployments, you're just trying to collect data and move on. These are uh, long-term, decade, multi-decade monitoring systems. The right, and, and, and that was... Yeah, and that was, you know, that was part of the point of the slide that I showed with the tsunami forecast maps, um, because there are, if we have a, de a temporary deployment, um, generally in one location, uh, or one sort of smallish regional location, we, you know, uh, that alone won't be able to provide the information that is needed to update forecasts in the near real time um, timeframe that is necessary, for example, for tsunami um, alerts. All right, I believe it's time to pass it back to Bob then to uh, okay. continue. Okay, thanks John and thanks okay. Mark Paul. Okay, so I'll introduce the next speaker uh, who's Frederick Simons, a professor at Princeton University and also the president and founder of the EarthScope Oceans Consortium. And Frederick's talk is titled 50 Mermaids Reporting Seismic Waveforms from the Pacific for Five Years. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, oops, that is not the right one. I'm assuming that in a minute you will see my full screen. Yep. And I'd begin by acknowledging my uh, uh, most proximate co-authors whose work you will see uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, there are many more um, collaborators in our consortium, of course, but uh, Joel Simon, Jessica Irving and Siri, which or Pete, Pipat Pratamporn, um, have been most closely associated with the work that you're about to see. So first of all, thank you, Iris, right? Um, if you query your databases, there are some 46,000 stations that are or have been at one point on the earth and that are or have been or continue to be uh, delivering data and for which we can request data at the touch of a button. There's, this is nothing but absolutely remarkable that we can do. Of course, this figure shows you that the dense clustering is in the uh, more developed areas, more hazard prone areas, and obviously mostly on land as we have heard um, uh, many times uh, during the symposium. So I'd like to begin by showing this one picture from Hugh Bradner who in between developing the wetsuit and studying uh, mollusk shells also really opened up the oceans to marine seismology by first putting a triaxial geophone inside a pressure housing and dropping that thing first overboard with an anchor at, on the ocean bottom and then later on developing this free floating version of that. So this is 1970. Um, and uh, of course they had no proper timing, they had no proper communications, they had no proper location for these instruments, and they didn't even try to record earthquakes, they were trying to record the ocean noise spectrum, particularly the presence of whole ocean modes and so on, that they figured were responsible for the ocean noise that we are seeing on land seismometers. A year or two later, uh, him and uh, uh, collaborators like Reed and Brune and others uh, did something relatively similar, a sonobuoy with suspended hydrophone, and these are some of the records. So this is 50 years ago, um, noisy, noisy data and very hard for them to figure out where they were ultimately being recorded. So they did seismicity studies, mostly local event, but it was very, very far from being able to instrument the oceans in any sort of systematic capacity. So 
Argo, uh, the name is out, right? So as of yesterday, 3,924 floats. This number fluctuates every day because there are uh, uh, um, recent sightings and then there's uh, dying instruments and replenished things. Obviously that's the opposite situation. Argo, as far as I know, has no sensors on land. Um, and so as a community of marine uh, interested seismologists, we should sort of become a little bit more like Argo. So 15 years ago, this is when uh, the group of John Orcutt uh, and Jeff Babcock and Russ Davis uh, developed uh, the first MERMAID float, which stands for Marine Earthquake Recording in Marine Areas, Mobile Earthquake Recording in Marine Areas by Independent Divers. This was a solo float, one of those that is used in the Argo program, and it was equipped with a hydrophone and it recorded data. And this is what we took out a number of times and here's Martin Rappa, whose name just came up in the other presentation, developing, um, uh, deploying this, this uh, uh, first and only instrument that we then uh, built. Uh, and here's an example of the data. Time domain on the left, spectrograms on the right. The uh, first success was one teleseismic earthquake, a magnitude six at about 5,000 kilometers, about 46 degrees away, and then a number of smaller earthquakes. And ultimately, Mermaid 1 wasn't out for very long, but it showed that it could be done. So 10 years ago, when Chris Nolet, who was uh, then just in uh, transit from Princeton University to the University of Nice at Geo Azure, um, scaled up uh, Mermaid to uh, an, an apex float, so different construction, but still a sort of an Argo float, and again, equipped with a hydrophone and this time giving it the autonomy to not only record, but also report uh, uh, the seismograms uh, recorded uh, from the middle of the ocean. So with that, multiple, multiple experiments were done in the Indian Ocean, in the Mediterranean, and in the Pacific around Galapagos. I'm just showing you a, a smattering of earthquakes, uh, earthquake phases from P to PKP, from distant to local, from high to low noise uh, recordings, um, uh, to show you how this uh, instrument, uh, at this point in the second generation, had a two-year autonomy and recorded a whole bunch, hundreds and hundreds of useful uh, earthquake data that were then subsequently used in the first science experiment, namely to image a mantle plume in the upper mantle below the Galapagos Islands. Nevertheless, that still wasn't good enough. And so five years ago, just about, uh, Jan Hello uh, at the Geo Azure also, and the French engineering company Océan developed a grounds up redesign of the Mermaid instrument. And so the picture here that you're seeing is a third generation. Importantly, it has a five year lifetime. So it's a glass sphere, standard type of uh, marine sphere in two halves, filled with lithium batteries, filled with the electronics and the hydraulics to operate the bladder pump system with which this instrument can go down to uh, two, three kilometers, but it's not limiting. I mean, you change the pump and it'll go down to the entire ocean depth and even land there if uh, our current experiments are, are continuing to be promising. And it has a hydrophone, again, of a variety of types. And then it makes these cyclings, again, these divings, these profiles where it goes down currently to 1500 meters depth in our settings, listens and records whatever earthquakes it can do, uh, can, can record. And then the onboard algorithm continues to process it. And every time there's something useful, brings it back to the surface resets the clock, tells us where it is, uh, gives us the data, and then goes back on its merry way. So this is a near real-time solution. The minute, well, the hour after you deployed it, you may be getting data back. So here's a picture of uh, two mariners uh, deploying one of those things. It's essentially as simple as throwing these things overboard gently, but it doesn't require a big ship doesn't require a big crane and it doesn't require a highly skilled crew.
So currently where we're we at is this is a, uh, we're in a, in a phase of the project where we have teamed up with international partners. So there is Geo Azure in France, there is Jamstack in Japan, there is the Southern Institute of Science and Technology, SUSTEC in Shenzhen in China, there is Princeton, there is soon Stanford. Uh, this is a picture here of the 16 instruments that Princeton launched on at the time of their launch. Obviously, they're drifting away. Here's a picture of where they have drifted in the last uh, year and a half or so. And let's take a look at these data here. Now, uh, four on the left and on the right, we're seeing two uh, global earthquakes. The Fiji Islands, 500 kilometers depth, Kuril Islands, 55 kilometers depth. Look at the Y scale between five degrees distance and 50 on the left, and then going on to all the way across the earth and we're picking up earthquakes after earthquakes uh, uh, phases of a variety of, um, uh, of, 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 of types, essentially. So here's uh, our uh, uh, network. Uh, we're just showing data from 16 instruments, but remember we have 50 right now. What about these onsets? We're developing the algorithms to uh, do the post-processing and to determine highly accurate timing residuals so that we can actually do tomography. So compared to what the predictions are in 1D, 2D, 3D elliptical reference modeling models, we are trying to figure out what the uh, timing residuals are, what the signal to noises are so that we can use them as weightings in tomographic inversions. Um, and so here's a couple of examples of these, of these waveforms. And then ultimately we wanna go much beyond the first arriving waveforms because we want to model the entire waveform itself so that we can do proper full waveform tomography the way uh, our science is going. So what of these later arrivals? Well, here's a, a cartoon of, of, of what you should be imagining, right? So there, there is earthquakes close and far and they're sending all sorts of waves, P waves, PKP waves, Rayleigh waves, some of them converting into uh, T waves in the water column, uh, all of which we ultimately hear. So yes, this instrument is just a pressure hydrophone, but yes, it records conversions of all sorts of non-primary first arriving P waves as well. I'll give you two examples here. Here are some, you know, uh, this is 1100 seconds after the earthquake. Here we're uh, seeing a, a, a small number of inner core and outer core interacting faces, PKP, PKIKP, PK little IKP, in high signal to noise ratios, so that we literally can do whole earth studies with, with this part of the late arriving record. And here is a typical signal of um, uh, an earthquake that not only has already given us the, the, the P wave arrival, but it also shows a clear conversion from the S wave arrival, shows a clear surface wave that is coming in here, and then uh, shows a T wave that's being generated and that arrives at about the water speed. So um, normally, in the normal operations, what Mermaid does already now, every day, is it just gives us 200 or 250 seconds of a seismogram, which are accumulating um, by the tens every day, uh, it doesn't normally give us two hours of data. We don't want it. We don't have the money to pay for it, but we can request it if we want it and have the money to pay for it. And these examples here, this particular example is from the one lonely mermaid that we actually recovered. Our mermaid instruments drift, they are autonomous, they're not recovered, that cuts the ship time. But we were out there deploying a second or a third batch of this particular experiment and we managed to be close to one and we picked it up and it gave us a full year of uninterrupted data on its memory buffer, which we have now been uh, analyzing. So that tells us what's going on when we're not already getting the data. Um, and so obviously you see be between 0 0.1 and one hertz here on this logarithmic uh, frequency axis, you're seeing that very, very noisy uh, band. And so now we have a year of continuous data. Let's take a look at what that is showing us. 
on the left and on the right are two months, um, December 2018 and June 2019, which we have analyzed by um, um, characterizing the population of power spectral densities on 100 second windows over uh, many, many, many overlapping segments. We have taken out all the earthquakes, all the T phases, all the transients due to volcanoes or storms or identifiable bursts of energy, all the ships that we've seen. And so uh, signal here tells you the proportion that we've removed. And the rest is just whatever happens at 1500 meter steps under the ocean. So by themselves, the curves are perhaps not that interesting, but it's in the variations that we're now looking. And so let's take a look at, at some of these um, areas here where between the months you can see tens or even more uh, decibel variations. Uh, I should probably mention that beyond 10 hertz, we don't want it. And below about, about 0.1 hertz, we are no longer getting a flat response um, and we are busy extending uh, mermaid types to having different hydrophones that will give us a little bit better um, responses below 0.1 hertz. But what we're looking at is, is in the range that we're confident uh, recording. But remember that on the right, it goes down by design. And on the left, it goes down in sensitivity. And we would like to up that sensitivity a little bit, bit more to higher, uh, longer periods, shorter frequencies. So now here is one week of mermaid's noise in the inverted red triangles. And the gray ones are uncertainty. So um, just look at the shape of the red triangles. And the upside, right side up triangles, the black triangles are the completely independent derived ocean wave spectrum. So remember the red is the acoustic pressure recorded by a hydrophone in the ocean and the uh, triangles in black are what the ocean waves themselves are doing. And so their shapes are very similar and their periods are each other's double or half. And so this is indeed the prime, the secondary microseism mechanism, but this is a main way in which noise is generated. And so what we are seeing is a complete correspondence in certain frequency bands. Here is throughout this whole year that we have observed in a particular narrow frequency band, the ups and downs of the weekly energy that comes in driven from above and recorded below in the water column. And so this is an example of a correlation coefficient of 0.8 or 0.9. And I'll conclude by showing you the last uh, uh, science graph here, which is a map of the correlation coefficient between, on the x-axis, the waves of the ocean, so the pressure generated by winds and swell and storms, and on the y-axis, the mermaid acoustic pressure. And where it's red, these two mechanisms, well, the driving mechanism is completely coherent with the received signal, and the dashed line is the line that doubles the frequency with which we understand the secondary microseism mechanism to operate. So here we are listening for all these earthquakes and reporting them and doing all sorts of uh, science with them. But in between, there's all this environmental science going on where we're really listening to what the waves are telling us about the state of the ocean which you may say we know from other means, but we don't always know it very well. And we certainly don't know it below 30 or 35 degrees south in the Southern Hemisphere. And so this opens up the potential for a mermaid-like instrument to not only deliver us earthquake signs and um, other noises, but also to uh, essentially become an environmental acoustic sensor. Now, there is much more to mermaid. It has currently one open port, Soon it will have up to eight sensors. There is a computer language that allows people, will allow the scientists to switch between applications, say between acoustics and maybe earthquake acoustics and whale acoustics, but also geochemical or environmental sensors that will just be currently plug, hot, well, not hot, but pluggable into the uh, device as we know it. 
It will have upgraded pumps to go down to full ocean depth. It will have a capability of landing temporarily and so maybe doing a few hops from places or staying in one place, perhaps on a shelf, perhaps listening for local earthquakes, perhaps listening to landslides, perhaps listening for all sorts of other signals. This is the map here um, of, uh, as of you know, a few days ago, where our instruments are. And so they're color coded here for the French, Chinese, the US and the Japanese. And uh, our organization is, is we want to be the uh, organization that helps coordinate uh, us, you, all of us together, bring more of this autonomous instrumentation uh, into the world. Uh, our data are collectively owned. We share them, we deposit them into the IRIS uh, uh, DMC. And so this is an advertisement for our, our consortium. And I will conclude by uh, flashing the reference and also saying that um, Karen Zigloch at Giro Azur is going to take the Earthscope Oceans to uh, the south of France, where ultimately Mermaid came out of. And so we truly are going to have a global span with partners in uh, currently Great Britain, France, Japan, China, Korea, and uh, various other places. And that's it. All right, I just checked the chat and I didn't see a question. Do, uh, are there questions uh, from the listeners? One thing I'm curious about is that have you deployed any of these in the uh, Sandoc, the um, uh, Arctic circumpolar current in the uh, south? No, not yet. So the, the current experiment, as you see here, uh, it's still centered on the plume rich regions of uh, Tahiti and French Polynesia in general. So here's the website describing the deployment. Um, we have currently deployed uh, 50, 51 instruments. 25 more are uh, owned currently by SUSTEC, by Professor John Chen in China. They are going to go into the ocean. Seven more have been built for Lucia Gualtieri at Stanford, who are going to specifically uh, listen for environmental noises. Um, and ultimately, it is our goal, and this is another of those objectives uh, that Khan will be taken to the UN Decade of the Ocean tomorrow, in fact, and jointly with Bruce, is that we want to be everywhere. We have the technology now. We know how to do it. We know how to run the operations. We know how to do the data analysis. We have been sharing it with the uh, community, and so we really do want to be everywhere. Are there questions? Mark? All right. Uh, yeah. Um, go ahead, Mark. Quick question. I'm, I'm wondering how, uh, how precisely do you, do you feel you know the coordinates of the sensor when it's been underwater for a while? Well enough for global earthquake seismology, given global earthquake location uncertainty. So in practice right now, we are at a comfortable depth of 1500 meters. We are coming up at a comfortable but not breakneck speed of about 12 to 15 hours. And many of our larger earthquakes in the 6.5s, you know, uh, and above range, uh, the, the seismograms are even truncated beyond a few hundred seconds because it's, it's, it, it realizes it needs to come up and tell us right away because then we will minimize our location uncertainty. So obviously, the, the, we keep track of the drift at, um, when we're at the surface. And roughly every six days, we get a bunch of seismograms and we're interpolating between those locations. For the most recent ones, that's within a few hundred meters. And for the most you know, five, four days out, that's a little bit larger. But those events themselves are of lesser interest to us. So uh, a few hundred meters, it sounds like, is the short answer. Uh, that is uh, the, indeed the short answer. But remember that that scales with the earthquake mechanism. It can be a little worse, and acceptably so for larger earthquakes whose locations themselves are either not 
that well known or whose ruptures themselves are over longer areas. Okay. So it's good enough timing and location. Very interesting. Thank you. And Jim Garrity? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rodrigo. It was interesting to see how you guys are evolving with this. Um, and I, maybe this is minor compared to Argos, but it kind of occurred to me with, all, with lithium floating around in these things. Are there kind of safety or environmental concerns that you guys need to think about and mitigate against in terms of people coming across these or, or what happens to them when they, when they hit end of life? Yeah, so, so the end of life, and this is a, a thing with, with UNESCO, right? The, the, the neutral state of mermaid, the dead state, is floating. And so we're at five years, we are uh, missing two instruments that uh, may have been uh, hitting something. Um, so we're expecting to recover those haphazardly. The state of life instruction now is that when it reaches it, it will start broadcasting its location and we will try to mobilize a community of you know, passersby to pick them up, but then they will float at the surface. But uh, Monica's presentation just also mentioned the C-Trek um, thermal recharge battery. This is a, a, a sort of active collaboration we're also pursuing, whereby we would be powering these essentially forever using thermal recharge uh, materials. But yes, currently there's a bunch of lithium uh, riding around in the ocean. But compared, Jim, to taking a ship to recover an OBS, this is a negligible environmental cost, as you know how many thousands of gallons you burn per day to pick up an OBS. A bit of lithium around is, um, it's not the main environmental concern, but we are concerned about that, obviously. So most of our savings are from shipping home. And how about safety? I just know that when we handle them in a traditional OBS framework, we're very careful on the ship. And so are there also safety concerns with the people that are picking them up? I guess I would Not say. really. I mean, we, we, we cannot fly them. So in order to you know, ship them, we, we do have to pass customs and we do have to ship them overseas. But once on board, they're, they're you know, whatever the cell type is, they're just packed in there and we do not take special precautions beyond the, you know, be careful around batteries. So it's not a massive hazard once you have it on your ship. Other questions? Um, it's like Matt has Monica a earlier uh, talked about Sea Trek and. Uh, yeah. In reality, the, the she mentioned one watt, but the design um, uh, is actually seven watts, so it's uh, it's quite a lot of power. So, 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 are you asking if it's enough or if it's so? so oh, it's plenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. track will make a, a thing to match your size. They will build it as big as you yeah. want, um, and so. To us, the reason that we haven't fully gone for it is, is cost, because the mermaids right now cost about $35,000, but the, the sea trek pack for it would cost about $35,000. And so we're, 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 um, we're at this point, we are completely funding limited. I mean, no US taxpayer dollars beyond the very, very first prototype were spent in developing this uh, instrument. And so we have had very little to play with, but uh, Sea Trek has bought a mermaid. They have developed a pack for the older instrument. In principle, they can do it. And so they are keen on, on continuing collaborations as, as are we and, and various of you. All right, well, thanks very much. Uh, Casey, I think you're scheduled for another break, if I'm correct. Yes. We are. Um, I do see there's a few more questions, but maybe um, those can be answered in the chat. Um, but yes, right. let's go ahead and take um, let's take a break though, because this is a long session, and I want to make sure everyone is refreshed. And so we have questions and active participation for our remaining speakers. So all right, uh, yeah, we'll be back at. Um, 6.45, so 15 minutes. Then respond. Absolutely, yep, great, great idea.
So, but, Casey, you want to go ahead today, now, or? Uh... Yeah, I think we should just go ahead and get started, because um, I did say we'd come back at 645, so. Um... Okay. Um, well, we have a, a, a slide up uh, for the <laughs> yes. next talk, Ching Yang. Uh, talking about the uh, evaluating the performance of newly developed Chinese passive source OBSs. Um, so uh, let's go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Even here with, uh, in the early morning. Um, my name is Tin Yang. I'm from SourceTech, Shenzhen, China. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present. The, uh, the development, uh, what we did for the, the instrument development. Um, okay, um, just a, one slide to show the, the current state of the passive source OBS array experiment in China. Uh, you probably um, may or may not aware that the actually Chinese marine science model actually did a lot of uh, um, experiment around the global trends mostly in South China Sea and uh, Western Pacific. And uh, so this is uh, the spot that the people put the OBS on, 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 on these locations. And there's other probably bigger uh, project is, uh, is underway um, in um, West Pacific and the Indian Ocean. But uh, unfortunately there's uh, most of the experiment is not uh, is not that uh, successful. Um, probably half of the instrument is just uh, lost or even even worse. Um, even the recovered when the data data quality is not that good. Um, so uh, so basically, this is the, the instrument available for Chinese uh, seismologists to do this marine uh, observation is not good enough. Uh, so about uh, four years ago, I moved to the source tag. So take advantage of the resources provided by the new university and to start to build this uh, instrument. Uh, you can see from the, the slide, we have the different models um, starting from 2017. We actually, the first two is just prototype. We, don't, we didn't make it a lot, um, but uh, starting from the source generation, um, we, uh, we have confidence that you can drop to the real ocean. And uh, the, the result, I think it's, uh, it's not bad. Uh, we now have uh, about 15, um, something probably more than that, uh, the, the, the third and the, the first generation of the, um, so called Pan Kun. Uh, by the way, the name is, uh, the, 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 the Kun is uh, from the Chinese mythology. Um, and, means it's a big fish in the ocean. So the pan means rock, uh, stable. So that's the name. So this slide shows the, um, the internal structure of the pan kun. Uh, you can see the, um, this is arm to hold the, the seismometer, uh, the, the pressure case for the seismometers. And when the, the whole OBS descend to the sea floor, the, the, this, the, the sensor is still hanging on the arms and uh, about uh, after probably a few hours, you can adjust the time and the, the, the device will automatically release the, the sensor and to, to drop to, to the ground and starting to record. Um, so we use, the sensor is used as a training compact uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the probably one region feature of this uh, instrument is we we use in this synthetic form for the flotations. Uh, one advantage of that you can make the shape um, you, you want. Uh, so we uh, just uh, manufactured it to went to the shape. It's called uh, uh, we call it an anti current uh, shape because we the, the shape is kind of um, a hubble. Uh, so the, the seismometer is just sitting in the, in the middle of that with the, the plastic cover. So this uh, sensor should be um, isolated from the deep current. So that's it. 
that's where the, the unique re feature of this uh, instrument. Um, also, we derived we derived what the uh, low power consumption, uh, the DAS uh, data acquisition systems. So it's supposed to uh, work at the sea floor for about fifteen months. Uh, and the needed reason we, we add the DPG on it. Um, so the, uh, in 2019, we uh, tested in the South China Sea, we deployed six um, uh, in the deep ocean basin, uh, the water depth is about uh, 4,000 meters. And we, we, we recovered about two of them uh, immediately, the same cruise. Um, and the rest four just stay at the sea floor for uh, seven months. We, we all, we, they all we recovered at the May 2020. Um, they all recovered. But uh, when, when uh, OBS have a one problem, because the, the thing, the cable in, inside the, this, um, the sensor, uh, Pressure case is, is broken because of the, the, the very high pressures. Uh, because this goes into the, the uh, it's complicated, but it's just the cable is, is broken. That, that's, that, that station is low data. So we have the, uh, for this evaluation, we have the three um, OBS for this uh, uh, evaluation. So let's look at the waveform first. And this is a, um, the waveform from the three OBS, I, th I think it's different the size of the Mac earthquake and different uh, um, epicenter distance. Uh, so it's basically is is as pretty good. Um, and uh, to say it more clearly, we we compare this with the uh, nearby land stations. So this is the earthquake. Uh, it's this pretty big earthquake from the property near the ocean. Uh, uh, but the vertical is uh, obviously is pretty good, but the, I think the um, horizontal is still, uh, there are some um, waves, long period flut fluctuations, but it's, uh, if you use a narrow band, they should got the, uh, got the high quality horizontal data. Um, this is a smaller one uh, from the uh, Indonesia. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, and uh, uh, this is, um, but this one, some, for some reason, the, the horizontal quality is not as good as the, the first two one, uh, maybe because the size and the magnitude is smaller. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention that the, the yellow, the yellow, uh, the yellow uh, seismogram is from the OBS. And the black is from the land stations uh, or island station and island stations. Um, um, okay, there's a uh, uh, more seismogram to show here. Uh, we have the regional ones, but probably magnitude is uh, um, 4.9 or 5, something like that. Uh, this is unfiltered, this is original seismogram. Uh, so this uh, was. Some of the stations, for some reason, they have the long period, um, just the noise. Uh, we, we don't know why, uh, but uh, not always, but sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's come out. And it's more rig original event. And unfortunately, there's no uh, local event at this region. Um, maybe there's, there's some, but, uh, but it's, that doesn't show at the catalog. So we probably need to run the tools to detect them. Um, okay, this is a relay wave discussion. Uh, we can um, see this is a filtered, uh, narrow band filtered the, the, uh, the waveform with a different uh, period. And, and you, we can probably can go to the, um, we can pick up the group velocity up to close to, oh, 100 second uh, safely. Uh, also, we did, uh, did some processing work. Uh, for example, if we uh, determine the horizontal orientations using the relay wave polarizations. Um, so this is uh, when the um, correlation co coefficient between the vertical and the 
and uh, uh, radio component and goes to high enough. So the all this event, the one point is the event um, so convert to one uh, atomos. So means that uh, at this uh, uh, direction probably the the real north. Um, another important thing is the we want to see whether the um, the sensor is really level uh, to do the um, tilt noise analysis um, based on the method developed by by uh, So um, for these two uh, OBS, you can see the um, the tilt angle. This is the middle one. This tilt means tilt angle. It's, it's almost zero. So um, and the coherence is pretty high. So it's uh, as we can see this. The live word and this one is, is actually have some uh, angles, but uh, if you look at the coherence, it's uh, it's pretty low. Uh, so that means the what the angle got is probably not real. Uh, it's, it's actually um, the, uh, the the the, the word but uh, uh, so that's why the coherence is is pretty low. Um, and uh, so based on the waveform and uh, uh, the, the another analysis, we, we think that the, the probably the, uh, the three component uh, sensor program is pretty good. We see probably the, the so-called anti-current shape of this uh, instrument probably it's, uh, it works and, and uh, the maximum the, uh, the effect of the um, deep current. Um, um, but uh, until we do this, um, we do the noise spectrum for this uh, uh, data set. This is one of them, the web of the station. It's, you can see the, for the vertical, it's, 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 it's good. But the horizontal, the long period, um, the noise level is still very high. It's, it's higher than the, uh, the, the, the noise mode of the Earth. Uh, so, um, that means the the, the anti correction anti current uh, probably is not not working uh, at all. Uh, so we want to see why because this based on the, the shape of the of, of the sensors is really isolated from the um, the current. So we did a test at the one of the GSN station. We put the OBS on the on the line, uh, but not the whole system. Just the the pressure um, the pressure case with with this sensor and the gimbal, of course. Um, so uh, this is uh, the GSN, GSN station at the uh, at the cave of the Shushan at, at the suburb of Shanghai. So we got the uh, spectrum. So you can see the. Um, Vertical is not very good. Uh, the, the, it's it's good, but it's for the for, for the horizontal is already uh, even if aligned. It's already already is high enough. Uh, so at least we can see the um, the long the high long period noise level uh, is act, can be partially at least partially contributed to the gimbal because we have to have this gimbal. For the for the sensors, um, if we just put the sensor there, the, the noise should be not like that. For even for the horizontal com component, um, and uh, oh, that's that's the one conclusion we, we got. This is we learned probably we, we, our our gimbal was not good enough to 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 remove the long period um, uh, levels. Um, uh, based on the the this um, noise spectrum, we probably have some implications for the for the max sensors. For example, the first one is uh, if you notice that uh, the we just look at the vertical ones, we didn't see any like, single frequency max sensors. Um, so we interpreted it because that's this region is uh, is just uh, in under the continental uh, slope. The the single frequency generated at the at the shallow waters so when they, they, they have trouble to travel back into the deep water at short short distance so that's uh, caused the uh, single frequency mechanism is uh, uh, it's very weak even you cannot see it uh, 
Also, the um, for the double fork country mechanism, uh, if you look at the uh, the peak, looks like it's shaped to the high frequency, uh, and um, so that's that we interpret that because the uh, this is the source region of the double frequency mechanism. So when it's generated, it, you have to travel into the land to uh, to generate this peak. So the, the high frequency content probably attenuated. Um, um, Decayed more, so that uh, makes the, the peak shift to the the, the high frequency, uh, and also at the um, vertical um, spectrum, you can see that there's a bar at this area. It's uh, larger than uh, at the period longer than one one hundred second. So it looks like that's probably the the related to the Earth's harm. So we uh, based on the Long period of broadband um, seafloor data, we can see this. Uh, uh, we are not quite sure of, the, of this. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to say about this. Um, we just have two conclusions. So, for the most of the um, seismic applications, I think the, the Pankin the data is, is good enough to, to, to do. Um, Pick the, the faces, main faces, and uh, even for the visual function of the uh, anisotropy um, studies. But uh, the, in terms of the, the instrument uh, development, we have a lesson to learn that the leveling system probably is also very important to, um, to uh, uh, maximum the, uh, to make maximum of the, 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 the noise of the horizontal component. Um, Okay, that's uh, that's that's my talk. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Cheng. <clears throat> Are there? We have just a, a few minutes, couple minutes for questions. Any? Let's see if I've checking here. Either uh, Mark. Question on the gimbal system and why it causes noise. Is this a is it a passive gimbal or is it actively uh, level the sensor with a motorized system? And, and how would you change it to improve it? Um, this is a passive, we, we, did, we don't have any um, uh, model in it. It's just uh, based on the, um, the, the gravity. But that, of course, we did something with the, with the sensor to, so that the, 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 the uh, the magnitude uh, goes to very deep. So, uh, okay, so it's a passive gimbal that uh, can swing under its own weight to near vertical. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, is it is it then clamped at that position, or can it continue to rotate as time after the deployment? No, yeah, it's a, we are uh, relevering if the if the if the angle goes goes uh, uh, not work anymore um, because the substations something like that. If we are we are relevering uh, starting. Um, it will, it, it's we're testing whether the, the it's level or not, um, and we we haven't figured out another way to to do this to to improve these uh, gimbals um, so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Uh, how long can you leave the uh, instruments on the seafloor? How long? What's their lifetime? Um, yeah, it's uh, I, I should say, but for now, it's just uh, you know, we deployed for seven months, and we after that we test the 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 battery um, using the uh, I don't know what's the um, to how much battery left we use your device to do that. Uh, it's, uh, so at least we, if it keeps the way at the, at the sea floor, it's, at, at least we can stay at about 15 months. Um, but uh, that's just, it's just, uh, if, the, if it's not leveling, you know, the, the, the consumption will, will go up. Um, uh, theoretically, so we, we can uh, the left time. It should be 15 minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ting. Appreciate the talk. 
And again, if you're just joining us and didn't hear the message before, uh, please, if you have a question, uh, if we didn't get to your question, go ahead and type it into the chat box and Teng might be able to respond as we're moving on to the next talks. So I'll introduce the next talk uh, by Bruce Townsend, who's the Vice President of the Seismology Division and the Chief Technology Officer at Nanometrics. And his title is already on the screen, so I won't bother reading it aloud. Bruce, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I just need to make sure that I can get into uh, um, display mode here. I hope that's worked. Yep, that looks good. Great, thank you. So thanks for your time, everyone. Um, a pleasure to be able to uh, join you all. And talks have been uh, very, very interesting. Um, the uh, I wanted to give you uh, some sense of, of what our recent event, uh, investments and advancements have been in, in our research and development pertaining in particular to uh, ocean bottom. Um, but before I touch on the ocean bottom in particular, um, in, the last, uh, in the last little while, um, we've had a very strong focus on uh, pushing the boundaries of size, weight, and power, making our instruments as small as possible, as lightweight as possible, and to consume as little power as possible in the interests of uh, portability, but with the constraint that we've imposed upon ourselves that we do not compromise performance or reliability. And then that's uh, translated to some benefits that we can apply in ocean bottom seismometry very directly. Because of course, uh, the footprint and power consumption are really pertinent, both in, in, for free fall um, systems and uh, for uh, uh, cabled or acoustic telemetered systems um, as well. There's really been three uh, uh, phases or uh, avenues that we've pursued. One is on the data acquisition side. Another is on the seismometer side, the, the two basic fundamental instrumentation components. And then on the deployment systems um, you know, themselves. Uh, and I uh, want to touch on each of those uh, very briefly. This is going to be a very superficial overview. Certainly welcome any further inquiries um, or conversations uh, and collaborations that might result from, um, uh, from that. Um, we've also had a focus on streamlining workflow. So not just size, weight, and power, but also trying to make it as easy as possible to use the instruments and the systems that the instruments go into, viewing it as a complete ecosystem, and then being able to address all aspects from the planning uh, phase right through to the use of data. Um, I want to touch on, on that as well. So some of the design principles that are focused on the benefits to the operators. We wanted, first of all, to have the same seismometer options in the sea as we we're able to have on land. So anything that we can do on land, any performance um, uh, uh, point that we achieve on land, we want to be able to put into the ocean without compromising instrument performance. We want to minimize size, weight, and power. We want to have easy, you know, quick and efficient workflows. Uh, we want to ensure that our systems are not a you know, monolithic single use case, but rather that we've built a sort of a Lego kit of, uh, of inter interoperable uh, components not only ours, but also um, uh, the third party and off the shelf uh, systems components that, um, that go together well and can be adapted for many different use cases. We want to ensure that precision timing is a part of our uh, considerations. And last but certainly not least, that the data that's produced by these ecosystems is ready to use. We've often heard that data is um, collected, but then difficult to acquire, uh, retrieve, reformat, correct timing, um, and, and so on. I'll touch first on seismometers. Um, you're, you're familiar with the Trillium Compact. Um, you know, we just heard 
uh, from Ting Yang uh, about his use of the uh, Trillium Compact Land Instrument in his own, uh, in, in the gimbal that SUSTEC has, the passive gimbal that SUSTEC has developed. You'll be familiar with the Compact OBS gimbal uh, product that um, uh, has been available to the community for several years now uh, and uh, has, has worked fairly well and uh, proven to be fairly reliable. Um, one thing that uh, you, you may not uh, be aware of is that um, we are currently at hard at work at uh, taking our uh, top performing uh, land-based units, the Trillium, the Trillium Horizon uh, seismometer line, which includes both a, a 122nd and a 362nd at um, significantly lower noise floors and packaging those in a gimbal system similar to the Trillium Compact. We're able to do this now because of the shrink that we've developed on, the te on that technology platform on land. Um, it now it allows it to go into a much smaller uh, uh, gimbal and, um, and uh, at, at much lower power. Um, it, uh, it, it, it as, as with the compact, it doesn't have a mass lock or a gimbal lock. And so um, we anticipate a equally reliable, trouble-free operation. Um, very similar architecture to what's used in the compact OBS gimbal, uh, just sized up slightly. Um, and it's in a titanium vessel. And you can see from the uh, self-noise uh, plots here that the, um, uh, the Horizon OBS at 120 seconds um, is about the same performance as those that you're familiar with the, with the BBOB system that uses the older generation Trillium 240. And then the 360 second instrument is at even lower noise for than that, practically under the low noise model um, uh, uh, down to, um, well, nearly throughout its entire range. Minimize size, weight, and power. So talking about the power, the, the compact is about 190 milliwatts. Um, surprisingly, we're able to achieve a power of only 230 milliwatts for the 122nd, and even for the 360 second, 290 milliwatts. So compare that with the that little faint green line where um, that blue arrow is pointed to on the screen right about there. That's the Trillium 240 self noise performance. So you can see that the OBS 120 is virtually the same performance um, uh, as, the, as that older generation 240, the 360 second, um, you know, even, even lower than that. Besides fitting it into this titanium pressure vessel here, which is about uh, 12 and three quarter inch diameter, just a little bit you know, larger than this, um, uh, it, that can also be repackaged uh, for those who want to upgrade the uh, BBOB system um, with this new lower power and higher performance uh, instruments. That's also a possibility. 50 degree tilt range uh, from uh, horizontal uh, levels to true vertical. And the key thing is that it's compatible with the Abalone's deployment system that was developed by Scripps. Uh, without um, without significant modifications, so the same shell can um, deploy this uh, system. Uh, quickly moving to um, data acquisition, uh, the uh, OBS um, uh, uh, data acquisition system that we've referred to as the Pegasus. Um, we've started shipping our first version. We're, we're uh, quickly um, uh, transitioning to a version two that'll be available in, in July, simply a size, slight size reduction and changing the mill circular connectors out to more fit for purpose connectors suitable for inside a pressure vessel. Again, very low size weight and power, 28 to 24 bits, depending on the sample rate. As the sample rate drops, you get the benefit of more, more, more bits. Um, uh, sample rates up to a thousand samples per second, 240 milliwatts with all four channels. Um, and uh, what that means is that you, for, for less than half a watt using uh, um, with a, a very broadband seismometer, those two things together then achieve uh, you know, 60 to 65% lower power than, it, than a current BBOB system would with its, um, with it, with its current digitizers and current uh, seismometers. Relatively small thing, 
uh, less than seven inches by four by two and a half. Um, one things that we've uh, focused on is, is having a system where you don't need to open the pressure vessel that contains the data logger to either configure the system or to retrieve data from it. You can configure the system, actually you can configure it on land before you go out, but you can configure the system on shipboard with a Bluetooth enabled mobile device um, uh, without touching the uh, uh, pressure vessel. And you can, um, using a, a USB 3.0 interface to a laptop or a, or a, a bespoke uh, harvester device that we provide, you retrieve a, a full year of 100 sample per second data for channels in under four minutes. And when you get that data, it's complete. It's, it's either raw or time-corrected mini seed data in that format as you choose. And it also automatically generates the station XML system response metadata, meaning all the poles and zeros and the system sensitivity and so on are all wrapped up in the um, you know, community standard station XML format ready to use. So that means that when you get the data, four minutes after the thing has emerged from the ocean, you can be analyzing it without having to do any data conversions. It's fast, boot time 10 seconds. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's also uh, enables a, um, a very efficient and trouble-free synchronization on shipboard between the GNSS, which is built into the device, um, and the internal clock before it's deployed. And then after you retrieve it, a single button push to resynchronize it, measure the gap and allow you to do either manual or automatic uh, time um, interpolation and correction. Um, and then uh, uh, there's details on the, on the, on the timing system. Um, we won't go into that as time doesn't permit, uh, other than to say that there is a, a, a precision C-scan clock, although it also admits other uh, single pulse per second uh, uh, clocks that, that could be uh, adapted to it. And then lastly, um, the, all of this fitting into a, uh, a scripts developed Abalone's deployment system pictured here, sloping sides for a uh, high degree of trawl resistance, um, a, uh, containing the seismometer that fits into the middle of the well, either a compact or one of the new Trillium Horizon OBS systems, uh, and the Pegasus data logger along with batteries and acoustic modem. Um, and the other things. There's a cutaway version um, of the uh, seismometer, in this case, depicting the new Trillium Horizon OBS, either the 120 or 360 second version, suspended there before dropping onto the, onto the sea floor. Um, so shielded for, for optimal noise uh, uh, reduction um, and uh, 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 when dropped, then you know, isolated from um, if, you know, acoustic noise of the, of the uh, Abalone's frame itself. Um, batteries are highly um, configurable. Um, you can populate it from anything from a two-month deployment with a compact seismometer to 20 months or, or up to, to 17 months or with the 120-second or 15 months continuous deployment with the 360 second. And that's derated to um, you know, full deployment at, at zero degrees C. Uh, there's also a battery tiered battery failover. You can use the main battery pack, it exhausts itself first, then the secondary battery pack and the data logger exhaust second. And then there's a timing backup pack that keeps the timing system going for years um, if, uh, if the system isn't retrieved after the recording is stopped. There's a whole workflow that's behind this thing. And just to summarize the key takeaways, same size monitor options available now for OBS as there are as, as we have for land instruments without compromising performance, really achieve low, uh, you know, new benchmarks for, for, for low size and, and, and power. The data is ready to use right off the box. The workflow is, is designed to be quick and efficient and it's highly modular. So that's where we've come to. Um, the uh, investments have been um, largely made. We're in the final stages. You know, the Pegasus OBS is available now. Version two is available in June or July. 
The uh, seismometers um, themselves are, are in design. We anticipate get, you know, dependent on community interest that we could have them as, as early as um, uh, April or May, about this time next year. We're open to fully uh, making available fully integrated turnkey solutions um, or providing the instrumentation for integration into other systems or for recapitalizing existing fleets. And we're certainly open to um, uh, adapting the technology to semi-custom or full, full custom um, uh, uh, bespoke system designs that you might be interested in. Uh, so I'll leave it at that as I think the time is gone, but certainly um welcome any any questions now or, or later uh there are some questions on the um on the chat if you could uh check those um um it may be that we don't have time for other questions uh what's the feeling uh at headquarters or yeah i think Casey. Yeah, I think we might want to um, move on, but thanks so much, Bruce. Yeah, there's, there are a few questions in there, and yeah. um, I think I'll, a few I'll, more. You know, I'll, re I'll respond to them on the, in the chat. Uh, Casey, thanks very much. Yeah. Thank thanks, you. Bruce. Okay, I think um, looks like... Helen's ready, so John, did you want to go ahead and introduce? Or Bob? <laughs> oh, I can. oh, yeah, I think Bob is introducing okay. Mark, who probably knows who he is. Okay. I think we have to we may have, up first. We may have jumped, <laughs> jumped one. So here, I'll go ahead and introduce Helen uh, Janiszewski who's going to talk about 10 years of broadband ocean bottom seismometer data, fresh insights and persistent questions. Okay. Helen? Thanks very much for the introduction and thank you uh, to the conveners of the session for inviting me here today and for everyone uh, tuning into this talk. So as we've been hearing about all sorts of new technology for marine seismology, instead in this talk, I'm going to highlight a new compilation uh, that we're working on that, uh, of OBS data that will hopefully uh, help the community more effectively use data from broadband OBS instruments, as well as aid with future uh, comparisons with novel emerging technologies. So to start off, what do we already know about using data from OBS instruments? I'm gonna outline four focus areas that will frame the topics covered in this talk. We know that data from OBS are typically noisier than that from onshore stations, as evidenced here by Power Spectra from the Cascadia Initiative Instruments. Significant sources of that noise are compliance and tilt signals. Secondly, we know that the frequency extent of compliance noise, which is noise on the vertical seismogram component induced uh, from seafloor deformation due to loading in the water column from infragravity waves, is depth dependent as shown by an example of uh, two different depth stations here and the amount which compliance uh, noise corrections affects the data shown in the black traces. Uh, we also know that the strengths of the tilt noise observed on OBS instruments, which is noise induced on a vertical seismogram component due to horizontal tilting of the instrument, uh, ha has been shown to be stronger on some instrument designs, uh, in, which was shown by Sam Bell uh, using Cascadia Initiative uh, instruments. And the last point I want to highlight today is that um, we've seen some recent studies that have shown that removing uh, coherent tilt and pressure signals in the microseism band uh, can actually reduce the amplitudes of fundamental mode cross correlations um, uh, in ambient noise data uh, while increasing the amplitudes of higher overtones. Um, and so this could have important implications for depth sensitivities for analysis from ambient noise, um, but there hasn't been much systematic investigation into uh, these observations yet. 
So why is this compilation important? Uh, well, we know a lot about OBS data. Uh, most published knowledge is from analysis of single deployments, which typically have a limited depth range. Um, and with a few exceptions that I'm highlighting in bold here, usually only use a single instrument design, even though there are many in existence used by the uh, OBSIC fleet. So our new holistic analysis includes more than 593 instruments that have been deployed uh, by either OBSIP or OBSIC over the last 14 years. And this allows for more complete uh, water depth and uh, instrument design uh, catalog, as well as investigation of different ocean settings. So we're aiming to compile a database of systematically calculated average OBS noise spectral properties from one to a thousand seconds, uh, which we link to useful metadata from the last 14 years of OBSIP or OBSIC deployments from broadband OBSs. Uh, some of the parameters that we've been including um, are instrument design, seismometer type, water depth uh, of the instruments deployment, uh, sediment thickness, and distance to coastline. Um, much of this information was manually cross-checked by reading cruise reports. Um, so if anyone ever sees any uh, issues, I'd very much appreciate it being pointed out to me. Um, and any additional suggestions of other parameters to investigate would also be appreciated. And I wanna just emphasize that the main goal of this is to better characterize the range of noise properties that are observed at OBS uh, instruments in different environments and less about any sort of assessment of comparative quality metrics um, between OBS. Um, there's a lot of variables in there that we really are not accounting for well here. And then we're also not considering things like recovery rates, data dropouts, or other variables that would be um, relevant if you really wanted to you know, fully holistically investigate quality control. So that's not really what we're getting at here. Um, I'm just showing this slide briefly, um, which details the processing steps for our noise analysis. I'm not going to uh, spend too much time on it now, but if you're interested, um, you can watch the recording and pause and read that information later. Um, we start by plotting the power spectra for the three seismogram components. So I'm showing vertical on the um, left and the two horizontals on the right. Uh, the x-axis is frequency, the y-axis power, and each one of these lines is a specific OBS instrument and where the colors indicate water depth, uh, as shown by the scale on the right. Uh, as expected, we see generally high noise levels, particularly on the horizontal components, although on the vertical there are quite a few instruments that are within the um, uh, uh, below the um, high, uh, high noise, normal high, yeah, excuse me, high noise model. Um, one thing we observe already is that there's a clear shift in the behavior for shallow water instruments, um, beginning around 500 meters water depth, um, where we see a very different um, uh, relative shape of the secondary and primary microseism. And to look at that in a little bit more detail, I'm showing um, uh, noise spectra from three deployments. These are the only three deployments that have instruments deployed at um, water depths shallower than 500 meters. Um, these are the ones deployed on the Alaska and Cascadia shelves. And these two show very similar noise profiles. And you can see that there's very, very clearly a distinct high amplitude um, bump uh, associated with the primary microseism that is as uh, high or sometimes even higher than the secondary microseism uh, bump. However, instruments deployed in Lake Malawi at these depths don't have this bump, um, presumably due to lower wave noise in uh, lake environments. Um, so again, this is highlighting the fact that um, there's some variability with a uh, particular environment um, that compounds on variables like water depth that these instruments are deployed at. So this compendium can be used to investigate systematic dependencies in the noise properties. Uh, here we're showing average power from uh, 30 to 100 seconds, um, so a range that would typically be used for surface wave analysis um, on the vertical and horizontal components. Uh, on the vertical components, even without corrections, um, we see that data for a lot of these instruments is good. Um, about 62% are below the uh, high noise model. Um, the average value, at least in this uh, period band. Um, 
And we also see on the vertical component uh, that there's a clear depth dependency um, where there are noisier conditions in shallow or water depths. Uh, by contrast, the horizontals are noisier, um, and you can see most of them in this period band are above the um, high noise model. Um, but interestingly, there really isn't uh, any sort of um, systematic depth dependence that really jumps out on the horizontals in contrast to the verticals. Um, and of course, on the vertical components, we can correct for tilt and compliance, and this uh, really makes our story a lot better. Um, this is just uh, predicted um, uh, noise uh, spectra from the tilt and compliance transfer functions. Um, and if we see after this is applied, nearly 80% are below the high noise model um, with quite a few, you know, coming in um, really at the, in the lower half of um, that, that range. Um, I should, oh, I should also point out um, that for the uh, corrected data, which you see in the lower panel here on this plot, um, you can see that the depth dependency is significantly reduced, um, which is, of course, due to the frequency variability of the compliance noise. Um, and you can see that this um, uh, really helps the usability of those shallow water instruments. Um, I should also mention that some data from the Alaska Community Experiment right now has uh, been removed because there's, uh, at the time of download at least, was a timing issue with the APG data um, that prevented uh, doing compliance corrections. So I uh, removed those to avoid biasing um, the corrected uh, scatter plot. Um, now, of course, this isn't strictly a fair comparison uh, between different OBS instrument types because all these OBSs occupy many, many different sites and there may be systematic differences uh, between the types of environments in which different designs of OBS have been deployed. So again, it's, it's difficult to really make very distinct comparisons here. However, I do want to just take a moment to highlight um, an interesting opportunity with the Cascadia Initiative experiment um, to leverage the design of that deployment to potentially control for some of these variables. Um, this deployment has been highlighted several times during the last week and a half, and in particular, uh, the fact that it reoccupied OBS sites through consecutive deployments has been highlighted as something that might not happen again anytime soon due to the trade-offs uh, between improved OBS battery life and cost saving on cruises. So in the Cascadia Initiative, we have some sites uh, that had two different OBS, or in some cases even three different OBSs, uh, deployed from two different cruises um, that presumably settled on the seafloor differently, uh, may have been subject to different weather conditions over the course of their deployment. Again, the data that goes into this is just uh, randomly selected 25 days during the deployment, so um, there's all sorts of different weather conditions that could be represented in that uh, uh, sampling. Um, so here I'm showing four sites uh, that had the same design OBS deployed uh, within uh, their, their uh, locations are within 500 meters of each other on the IRSDMC um, over multiple deployments. Um, and it's really quite remarkable, or at least I'm pretty amazed by the fact that, that of how similar they look and how many of these um, uh, even the high frequency characteristics um, of the secondary microseism peaks um, are, are very similar across different deployments. Um, and this suggests that there is some inherent reflection of seafloor conditions at these particular locations in this data set. Um, and what's interesting to add on to this is that there are sites that had different instrument designs um, reoccupy the same site. And so uh, sometimes there's good agreement between them, um, but this is not always the case, particularly at longer periods. Um, and at this stage, I think more would need to be done to really systematically characterize um, uh, these differences, um, but it might be a very interesting set of instruments to explore further. Uh, coherence is another useful property to investigate OBS noise. Uh, values of one bet uh, in coherence between two different components indicate um, highly coherent signal between components, um, and values of zero indicate lack of coherent signal. Um, this is a, typ a typical example for multiple days of data for a particular station. Um, and on the vertical and pressure um, coherence in particular, there's often a high coherence at longer periods due to 
infragravity waves uh, and a high coherence at shorter periods due to the microseism. And we can investigate coherence for all the instruments in our data set. Uh, here I'm showing uh, plots where the y-axis is water depth, x-axis is frequency, and each shaded line represents the average coherence for a particular instrument. Black colors indicate a value of one or high coherence, uh, white colors indicate a value of zero or low coherence. So let's start off by looking at the coherence with the horizontals. Uh, the shallowest instruments down below at the bottom of these plots um, have high coherence associated with the microseism, which for the moment we're going to ignore. Um, at larger depths, there's variability in coherence with the horizontals, um, but upon them further inspection, we find that similar to what was observed at Cascadia, uh, there's a dependency on instrument type um, where uh, the high coherence uh, signals that indicate tilt noise um, tend to be seen on OBS instruments that were uh, deployed with Goralp cmg 3 t seismometers. If we focus on the coherence between the pressure and the vertical, there are three major observations I want to highlight. First, uh, the depth frequency dependence of the compliance noise is very clearly visible and agrees well with uh, predicted uh, frequency ranges. Uh, secondly, at shorter periods, High coherences exist um, due to the microseism. Um, there's some variability in its frequency extent, and there doesn't seem to be any obvious trend with uh, depth variation observed there. And lastly, at the shallowest station, gravity band uh, basically intersects with the primary microseism, um, uh, which is we also see um, the uh, higher frequencies. Um, uh, above kind of the typical range of the secondary microseism, uh, the coherence in that area shifts to even higher frequencies. Okay, and finally, last uh, a few slides, um, I want to just take a brief moment to investigate this um, uh, effect of performing corrections on ambient noise data. So here are uh, corrections at Young Orca, um, where we see the observation of um, the fundamental mode weakening, um, uh, which was shown in the original data plotted in blue, uh, compared to the corrected data plotted in black, where we see um, the uh, first overtone becoming more apparent when corrections are applied in the five to 10 second period band. Um, in contrast, if that same exact methodology is applied on the ENAM data set, almost no effect is observed. So the question is why? Compare the predicted uh, corrections in these bands for the vertical power spectra, uh, finding that the average power, uh, which is shown in the top plot for the two deployments, is actually pretty similar. However, if we compare the amount of improvement between the original and the corrected data, um, we see that on average, Young Orca experiences um, nearly double the noise reduction compared to the majority of the ENAM stations. Uh, we can also add stations from other deployments to further investigate this trend. Um, here I'm adding now data from Albacore and Nomelt, um, and indeed the ENAM data still looks to have um, an anomalously small correction to the vertical component in this period band. Uh, these developments, these other two deployments are relevant um, because Albacore, which is shown here, and no melt, uh, which is shown um, by this paper uh, by Yang et al. here, um, they both uh, are deployments where this distinction between the um, fundamental mode and first overtone before and after corrections has been observed. So why do corrections uh, for ENAM uh, seem to have a smaller effect? Is it something to do with station type? Is it something to do with water depth? Is it something to do with deployment location? If we plot the vertical power spectra uh, for these four deployments, we see that the average noise levels between five and 10 seconds are lower at ENAM, um, and it has a narrower peak in the secondary microseism as opposed to a broader um, double frequency peak, uh, which is seen at Young Orca, Albacore, and no melt. Um, so this suggests that noise in this frequency band might be inherently lower at ENAM. Uh, so longer periods, of the secondary microseism tend to be related to distant wave-wave interaction, so 
perhaps this is different uh, related to a systematic difference in the locations of these deployments. Um, I don't think we can say this definitively at this point, but it'd be interesting to think about if there are systematic differences between the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean basins that might lead to this difference. Um, ENAM also is deployed on top of a very uh, thick uh, continental shelf, um, so that's another uh, potential consideration. And I'm going to admit I'm a little out of my wheelhouse when it comes to thinking about microseism sources, so I would really appreciate any feedback um, on this observation. Uh, regardless of the specific cause, though, this does suggest that site properties may influence the character of ambient noise cross correlations that can be used for determining seismic velocity models. So it'd be important to determine how regional or localized these effects could be for uh, future deployment planning. Um, and I just I'll finish up here quickly. Um, I'm just showing now all of the data sets and indeed um, ENAM is amongst the lowest, particularly at comparative water depths um, for the amount of correction that is observed in this band. So this still points further to it, uh, there being some sort of a site dependence here. So. Um, I'm gonna just leave my main takeaways up really quickly, um, but I hope that um, this seems like something that will be useful to the community um, uh, in terms of um, providing some uh, benchmarks um, for both evaluating past OBS data for thinking about future experiment planning and also comparing to um, potential new technologies. Um, I'll also briefly add that um, I'd be excited to see comparisons with international deployments um, and would welcome any uh, comments or uh, feedback on that if anyone's interested in collaborations. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Excellent talk. Thank you. We're a little over time here. So I think just in the interest of trying to get through the whole set before the, the, um, uh, the finishing time this evening, we should probably push on. But I'd encourage people, if there are questions for Helen, type them into the chat so she can look at that as we're going into the next talk. So the final, I believe it's the final talk, yeah, final talk of the evening is by Mark Zumberg at uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and he's gonna be talking about the seafloor geodesy instrument pool. Mark? Okay, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yep, uh, looks uh, good. Casey asked me to fill in on something that's uh, not so much seismic. Well, first, just, just a little background. <clears throat> Uh, as, as most of you know, and many I'm sure of you have participated in many of the, the workshops that uh, are held to, to plan what geophysicists should, should do in the future. And in, in the last decade, there were a number of workshops that uh, agreed on some things, disagreed on others, but there was one uniform recommendation from, from these workshops, and that was to expand our capabilities in seafloor geodesy, uh, <clears throat> partly, partly advanced because of the, the success of the EarthScope uh, program. The Plate Boundary Observa Observatory provided a wealth of information uh, on crustal deformation, but it, it ended right at the coastline. And of course, the continental plate doesn't end at the coastline. So, uh, in, in 2016, when NSF put out a solicitation for the National Geophysical Observatory for Ge Geoscience, that's the vehicle that currently funds IRIS and UNAVCO, the solicitation included the words uh, fr uh, funds for frontier capabilities supporting cross-coastal earth system science. That motivated uh, a group of us led by Dave Chadwell here at Scripps to uh, form a little consortium of, of fans of seafloor geodesy, their, their names are, are listed here. And, and we, we wrote quite a uh, far-reaching, broad proposal to, to that solicitation, uh, hoping to, to develop a, a center for seafloor geodesy. And that was gonna include a, a uh, number of transponders, deployed on the, in the Cascadia subduction zone, uh, other equipment that could be used by some other PI driven projects, a test site to compare different technologies on the seafloor, workshops and short courses to 
uh, kind of build the workforce for seafloor geodesy and ways to make the data publicly available and education and outreach. And unfortunately, that proposal uh, was not funded. Uh, a few years later, there was another opportunity from an NSF mid-scale research infrastructure solicitation. This is the thing that, that funds sort of $20 million proposals uh, across NSF. Each directorate usually gets uh, one, one project funded. Uh, so we scaled back quite a bit, asked for equipment and funds to get the equipment working and also continue on infrastructure and software development and, of, of course, continue to try to build the workforce. Uh, well, that proposal wasn't funded either. However, uh, thanks to the attention paid by uh, OCE program managers, uh, Debbie Smith and Candace Major were able to find uh, essentially what I understand was funds left over from that. And it allowed us to, we, we got about 40% of what we asked for to buy some equipment <clears throat> that's usable for uh, advancing seafloor geodesy. So we, we got the equipment needed for the uh, GPSA acoustic method of, of finding horizontal positions on the, uh, on the seafloor. Uh, this includes some pressure gauges that hopefully can detect vertical motion associated with slow slip events, uh, some funding for commissioning to make sure uh, that the equipment works. And we also separately got funding from for, for one, one workshop. So the, the equipment um, is listed here. Essentially, it's focused on the GNSS acoustic method, which I'll describe in just a second. We have enough uh, transponders to make, to create 16 or 17 sites on the seafloor. Uh, and a third of those have pressure gauges. We have funds to, to fabricate benchmarks so we can put out uh, these transponders on the seafloor and, and survey them for uh, a number of years, and then after recovering the equipment, the seafloor benchmarks will remain in place so we can come back in a few years or, or a decade or longer and replace uh, transponders on the, on the benchmarks co-located uh, exa exactly where, where the previous set of transponders lived. Uh, we have three um, liquid robotics wave gliders, which will be used to survey these seafloor transponders and, and finally funds to uh, test all this equipment, which we're in the midst of right now. However, it's, it's important, I think, to emphasize that uh, at this time, there's, there's no facility. That is, there's no uh, funded group that uh, a PI could say, well, I want to put some tr transponders out in a certain location and and have a, have a, a group of engineers deploy them and survey them. Uh, that doesn't exist. What, what we have is, is a pool of equipment. So uh, just, just to review, the, the uh, GNSS acoustic method was invented by Fred Spies in the 1980s when he realized that the, the uh, stratification of a sound wave in the ocean would let you acoustically find the center of mass of an array of seafloor acoustic transponders. So in this method, a, a, a vessel is, uh, is on the sea surface and the, the vessel's position is determined by GPS. It finds the, that location where the acoustic travel time to an array of seafloor transponders is, is the same for all of them. And in that case, you don't need to know the sound velocity profile uh, perfectly. And you end up getting the coordinates of the center of mass of that array. And then you do it at one epoch. And later on, if, if, those, if that array of transponders has moved, you can, you can find uh, the new coordinates to, to within something like a centimeter. 
the transponders we've bought are, are all commercial off the shelf made by Sonardyne and one third of them have pressure gauges. So in a, uh, if, if we adopt a method of having arrays of three transponders, then one, one in the array would have a recording pressure gauge and the data can be uploaded from, uh, from the wave miter. So in, in the early embodiment of, of this methodology, uh, a UNAL ship was used to do this work and Dave Chadwell uh, over the last five or 10 years has, has advanced it to uh, let us use a wave glider, which, which uh, is, is quite a uh, much less expensive operational mode. So the transponders look like this. This is, this is on one of these uh, benchmarks that can be uh, reoccupied later. We have to modify the transponders slightly to, uh, to fit on those benchmarks. So we've, we've started testing them. Of course, there was a delay receiving the equipment from COVID, but we have it all now. We're working out the, uh, some of the bugs that, that came along. I think we're sort of a beta testing site for some of the Sonardyne equipment. But uh, so far, we've taken some of the wave gliders out and as actually range to a, uh, to a seafloor transponder and, uh, and calibrated all the pressure gauges. And hopefully by sometime uh, late in the summer of this year, uh, everything will be ready to go. Now, the question becomes what, what to do with it. Uh, there's, a, there's a community workshop scheduled uh, early in April, and I invite anyone who's interested in that to uh, find it and register. We have, we have the equipment now, we, and we is, is not this little consortium of people who, who got together to get this equipment, but it's all of us uh, need to decide what, what is the, the best plan for this equipment, what, what experiment might might we do? The, the transponders have a 10 year battery life. So we can imagine a, a geodetic experiment that'll last uh, well, well into my retirement. All right, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mark? I didn't catch anything on the chat. I have a question. Yes. Where are you doing this beta test? Have you, and, and then what is the water depth? Um, so, so far, uh, so far we've tested only in 50 meter water depth, but we plan to test uh, further offshore, San Diego in a, in a thousand meters depth. And then part of the commissioning, we hope to support ongoing uh, geodetic surveys of existing transponders, offshore Alaska and offshore uh, Oregon and Washington. And, and those all involve 3000 meter water depth systems. Sorry, John, I muted you. I think there's some background noise, but um, it looks like uh, I couldn't tell who was first. Uh, Matt, maybe, was first? Yeah, thanks, Casey. Um, Mark, just quick question, not being uh, directly affiliated with this community, so I understand it's kind of a, a nascent effort. And um, in what ways are you affiliated with or, or not affiliated with uh, UNAVCO and GAGE? Uh, that's a good question. In, in our original proposals, we, we included a component that would uh, basically work with UNAVCO as a, uh, as a place to deposit data and make it publicly available. And that, that should definitely uh, 
happen, but that's that's not we're not funded at this point to uh, to take that step. We're only funded to uh, purchase the equipment, which we've done, and to get it ready to make sure it works. Thanks. And it looks like there's a quick comment from Andrew, just that um, Enavco is a co co I on the upcoming workshop. So. Um, Bruce? Uh, thank you, uh, Casey. Uh, Mark, great presentation, really. I, I, I don't know a lot about uh, sea, sea floor geodesy. So my question is, um, what, what is the necessary spacing between the transponders on the sea floor, the four transponders? Um, and how is that related to the depth at which they're located, distance to the wave glider? And what is the what is the maximum workable depth of such a system? The uh, <clears throat> the array is is typically installed with a spacing of about one and a half times the water depth. So uh, that means there are four and a half kilometers apart in a three thousand meter water depth. Um, the the Sonardyne equipment is, is available in, in two flavors. One is a 3,000 meter maximum depth, and, and, and that's the systems that, that we've bought now. Um, but they are available to go to, I believe, 4,000 or 5,000 meters. Sorry, I don't know that number, but uh, much of the geodetic work is in uh, subduct uh, that's the interesting areas are in subduction zones and spreading centers and uh, volcano flanks. Uh, so, so the 3,000 meter choice at, at this time uh, seemed like a good route. Sure. And, um, uh, you know, as, as you approach greater depths, does your, your one centimeter uh, your detection limit, uh, is that still preserved? Uh, it, it goes up a little bit, but uh, much of the noise is due to internal waves. And without getting into the, uh, the details, the, the limitation is not in measuring the, the travel times, it's in the variations of sound velocity. If the sound velocity depends only on depth, then it's, um, it's, it's not important at all. But in fact, there are, variations in sound velocity horizontally, mostly from internal waves. Internal waves, uh, you know, have periods of, of many minutes or hours. So that's usually dealt with by averaging. The, the wave glider uh, stays on station usually for at least a week, ranging during that time. And that's a, a effective means to remove the noise from internal waves. No, fascinating, thanks. Hey, any other questions? We might actually stay on time. <laughs> this was quite a session. Yeah, I'm... I'm very delightful. impressed with all the work that's being done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If there's no more questions, we might go ahead and then wrap up. Um, not, just give a pause here for a minute. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. Maybe I'll offer a, a few remarks here at the end. Uh, I just thought it was a great set of talks. Um, going through the whole the whole range, appreciate it. Appreciate all the hard work from the, the speakers. Um, really excellent. Um, <clears throat> I look, was just looking at the, the workshop calendar. There are some sessions tomorrow um, and a final wrap up session on Friday. So do be looking at that and uh, for any further things you wanna participate in. Um, other than that, I'd like to offer, again, a thank you to all of the speakers and to all of the participants for uh, being here for whatever, whatever time zone you might be in. 
it's probably <laughs> sort of unusual hours possibly for many of you. So I appreciate that too. Uh, Casey or John, any other final comments? No, I don't have anything further. Great, great yeah. day. Yeah, keep keep the discussion going um, on the chat in the event page. Uh, feel free, we'll have the recording up soon. But um, yeah, thank you, everyone. All right. Well, thank you, and have a great evening, everyone. Yeah.